Thank you. Welcome to the Town of Barnstable Conservation Commission hearing. Acting under the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 131, Section 40, and or two, Chapter 237 of the Code of Town of Barnstable. The Barnstable Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, November the 27th, 2018, at 6.30 p.m. on the application of Donna L., Robert Hawley, Douglas Hope Cohen, Henry Blair, Paula Cassisa, <coughs> E.M. Crosby Bulwark, Highness Rotary LLC, Jane Watt, and Steve Walker. The hearing will be held on the hearing room, second floor, Town Hall 367 Main Street, Highness Mass. The plans and application are on file and may be reviewed at the Conservation Office at 200 Main Street, Highness, during business hours. This meeting of the Barnstable Conservation Commission is being recorded and transmitted by the Information Technology Department of the Town of Barnstable on Channel 18. Under Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 20, anyone else desiring to make such a recording or transmissions must notify the chair. I see none. The next hearing agenda is on the side table next to the door on my left. On the agenda next to each application is the amount owned to the town of Barnstable for the cost of advertisements. When your application is called, please bring a check to Darcy Curling sitting on my left. Tonight, under the continuance, the application for Sousa will be continuous to no December the 18th as a request by the continuance. This is a second request for the continuance. <coughs> I have to take things out of order for the agenda. Um, we're waiting for Seth to come in to do the discussion on the land subject to coastal flow storm sewage. Land subjects to coastal storm flowage. And so I'll just kind of start with the RDA first, and then when Seth comes, we just switch over to that. Donna L. Demolished and rebuilt single family dwelling at 21 Medrin Way. Barnstable as song on the assessor's map 319 puzzle 008. <coughs> Good evening, John. Good evening, John O'Day from Sullivan Engineering Consulting, uh, representing Donna L. The property uh, 21 Meridian Way in Barnstable, a uh, small lot developed in the 1950s, uh, proposing to demolish and rebuild a new home. Uh, we are in the flood zone only. We're about 350 feet to the closest wetland, separated by three or four houses and two streets. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Question from Commissioner? None? Louise? Um, what are you planning on using for material for the driveway? Uh, the plan's called for gravel. And do you think that's going to um, continue to be permeable over time? I, I mean, I've heard stories from Commissioner Abadili that his gravel driveway is impermeable at this point. So I'm, I'm just, that's why I'm asking. I would be maybe more concerned if I was closer to a wetland, but we, we weren't overly concerned about it. Uh, I, we've talked to the owners, and you know, it's possible that we could switch to some sort of a paver if uh, you know the, there's rooms left in the budget but um, I don't foresee an, an issue to any wetlands well we're becoming more aware of um, concern uh, we are becoming more concerned about uh, flooding and the impact of impermeable surfaces in flood zones um, given global warming and more and more storms and so forth and so on so that's why I'm expressing concern. Larry? Um, in that this is a flood zone compliant structure, or oh, that's the intention, yes. is it, is it gonna be elevated? Is it, is that, it's normally, when we've got an NOI, it's all the details about the elevated uh, sub, uh, basement area or foundation, is that gonna be? So the existing house does have a basement, which <coughs> the new house will not. Uh, the floor elevation actually doesn't have to change drastically. Our, our first living floor is pretty much already 
set that one foot above the flood zone. You just have to create something underneath it to get. To so get there'll that. be a crawl space that's at the ground of okay. you know three or three okay. feet. I don't so. think that's really a conservation issue as much as it's a spec in the plan that maybe maybe you want to make clear if it's not. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, being an owner <coughs> of a quote permeable driveway after 17 years, you're right. It's not. They really aren't permeable, and, and I think we should at least where you're into a BVW kind of a situation, we should rethink gravel versus some kind of a drainage system attached to it. I, on a flood zone, it's I don't see it as a concern. Any public comment? Seeing none. Motion to approve is a negative determination. Second. All in favor? It's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Second RDA is Robert Colley, pumped and filled existing cesspool with sand and septic system upgrade at 90 Holy Lane, Sandyville, as long as the assessor's maps is 229 parcel 017. Good evening, Peter McIntyre with Engineering Works representing Robert Holly for the upgrade of a septic system at 90 Holly Lane. Uh, the uh, proposed work is going to be um, within the jurisdictional buffer zone uh, between the 50 and the 100 foot buffer. <clears throat> um, you have a revised plan being uh, sent around there. The only revision there was a correction actually to the uh, uh, setback shown from the soil absorption system to the BVW line. Uh, other than that, there's no other uh, change. Um, however, uh, this just went before the Board of Health uh, earlier this afternoon and they had requested another revision that the uh, separation uh, between high groundwater and the bottom of the leaching be five feet and not four feet, which is what I'm proposing on this. So they've approved the plan contingent upon me uh, showing the five foot separation. Other than that, horizontally, there's no change. Any question from the commissioner? So part, so part of my ignorance, sir, but that just means that you're, you'll have another foot higher. I'll have another foot higher. Okay, yes. thanks. Yeah. So the variance for the separation to the groundwater is not a variance. Yeah, no there problem. was a request, but we asked him to put the five foot back in there. So that's the revised This is approved. Plan. It would be subject to receipt of a revised right. plan showing that separation. Right. Any public comment? Delossi? Um, could you just uh, explain to the commission about the um, the black PVC pipe we were talking about of um, emptying the or draining the basement? Uh, will that well, stay in the same location? And uh, yeah, you know that that's funny because I went out there right after that to stake it and uh, saw that it was it was going right across the lawn. Yeah. Uh, when I had been there on a previous site visit, uh, the it sort of den dead ended in the um, the vegetated area uh, along the walkway to the pond. So that's new to me. I hadn't seen that before, but it does come from the sump pump that's inside uh, the house. It's a sump pump drain. Okay. Yep. We all set. Motion to approve. This is a neg negative determination. Subject to receive a revised plan showing five foot separation to groundwater. Second. All in favor? It's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Third RDA Douglas Cohen structure addition structure additions of new restrooms and deck to existing restaurant at 213 Ocean Street, INS at Song and Assessor Smith 326 Puzzle 035. Good evening, Mike. Hello everyone. Mike Ball here uh, for the applicant from Baxter and Engineering. As you mentioned, this is an RDA uh, for a restaurant addition project at 213 Ocean Street. This is the Hyannis Harbor Hotel 
um, property. Um, there is a architectural plan done by Brown, Lindquist, Venuccio, and Raber in your packet uh, that provides a good amount of detail. I won't go through all the detail. Um, I think probably the best figure for you to look at in your package is figures two and three that give you a good idea uh, of where this addition is going. The addition is essentially a, uh, two bathrooms with new decking outside these bathrooms. As existing bathrooms, they just felt they needed handicapped accessible uh, bathrooms attached to the restaurant. And so that's essentially what this, this project is. The, the resource area is, is land subject to coastal storm flowage. We're outside the buffer zone to the, to the nearest uh, other resource area, which is Coastal Bank. And that's a summary of the project. Question from Commissioner. None. Any public comment? None. Motion to approve is a negative determination. Second. All in favor? It's approved. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Going into the NOI, Henry Blair is to permit the use of a hydraulic dredging for, main, for maintenance dredging at Millway <coughs> Marina to permit a second to permit a second dewatering basins for larger amount of dredging material produced by the hydraulic dredge repair existing wood, uh, wooden bulkhead at 275 Millway Road, Barnstable, as shown on the assessor's maps 301, parcel 063. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, could I request that we continue this? Matter of just for a little while, there's a meeting scheduled with the waterways division in a few minutes on this. Um, I do have a second project. If you would mind just keeping that one in order, that would be good. Okay, thank you. We'll delay this later tonight. The later tonight, yes. Yeah, that's fine. I'll do it later. Great, thank you. Yeah. For CASESA, install, installation, planting, and maintenance of a coastal doom along seaward edge of property at 111 Sunset Lane, Barnstable, as shown in the assessor's maps, 0301, puzzle 030. Good, Good evening. evening again, Mr. Chairman. For the record, my name is Kieran Healy. I'm a land surveyor with the BSC Group, representing Webster Capasso. Casasso, I should say. Um, as you said in your outlay, we are proposing a small dune adjacent to the um, existing lawn that's out there to separate the lawn from the beach where the coastal erosion is happening. Um, the dune that we're proposing is basically three feet high. It starts at elevation seven, comes up to elevation 10, and then mounts back down to elevation nine and eight at the, uh, at the inside of the uh, dune that we're proposing. Um, we are proposing to plant it with the uh, beach grass once it is installed and um, hoping to maintain it in its current location. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Before I open up for any comment, I want to read a statement from uh, town attorney Charles McCaughlin. I discussed this matter with Charles before the meeting is because he kind of mentioning that this matter is with the commission should not get involved with the compete private claims that needs to be handled outside of the conservation jurisdictions proceedings. So, which, which is to say that any of the issues relative to whether it's town property, private property, public property is not to be addressed by this conservation. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Louise. Um, I have a couple of questions. How, first of all, how um, is this doom going to interface <coughs> with the neighbors? on either side. And second, I, I believe you talk about um, building the dune during the winter and then you're going to do the planting in the spring. And I worry about the integrity of the dune given all the storms and 
activity that, that goes on there during the winter, I, I just wonder how long that, that uh, dune is going to last between when you put it in and, and when you're able to plant it. So, so those are my two concerns. Uh, to answer your first question, um, on the um, easterly side, there is an existing dune that has been um, permitted, I believe, by the town. And we're going to pretty much match that one and our f the face of ours will be consistent with the face of that one on the easterly side. On the westerly side, <coughs> there are some loose rocks and some loose walls, a loose wall, but that is inside, so we will be actually further seaward of that, of the neighbor's side. And then it will turn in at the, at the property line. We will not be crossing the property so that, line. So that, however, could um, <coughs> kind of upset the situation on the neighbor's, on the westerly <coughs> side, right? I do not believe so because there's a stone wall there. I don't believe our sand is going to cause enough of a potential wave refraction that's going to affect the wall that the neighbor has. All right, and then what about the integrity of the dune? Um, the reason we're putting in the dune is to s stop the coastal erosion that's, that's com happening. We're hoping to plant it as soon as we can. Um, by the same token, by not putting in the dune, then we potentially face another three or four or five feet of erosion this winter. So it's important to keep the little bit of, of land that's left um, that's out there. Even if we have to lose some sand and then replace it again before we plant next, next year. I mean, you could lose the entire uh, structure. We could lose the entire structure, but if we don't do this, then we would lose five feet of existing land, which would make the situation even worse. Well, um, I'll let other people ask questions. Before I go to the other commission, and I think in the comment file, we have received about 10 comments, <coughs> emails from the neighbors. So I just want to mention that it's there in the file. So, John. Yeah, a um, couple of things. First of all, a soft solution is pretty good. Uh, I tend to favor soft solutions where they think they're going to work. But we are once again facing the question of building an artificial dune on land subject to coastal storm flaming so we've got one later on a continuance and on that one and we're also going to have a workshop on that very issue and attempt to establish I think regulatory standards and the one that's coming up later we sent it back for a continuance and the reason why is because we said although we don't have a regulation yet we think the following criteria need to be addressed by the applicant and we listed those criteria and in fact think they were addressed but that'll be subject to the continuance tonight uh, criteria such as does it have an adverse impact on on the ability of the, the land to absorb and contain floodwaters what's the impact on the neighbors etc those kinds of criteria that we used <coughs> for the hearing later tonight I think need to be addressed uh, I don't think they were addressed here again I think this is a fairly small project um, but I anticipate we're going to be facing fairly substantial projects and my preference would be in the name of being consistent is to ask you to go back take a continuance and look at those same standards that we used at that earlier hearing on the dune and address those in a written response so that's what I think would be appropriate for the Commission in terms of consistent behavior on the part of the Commission Dennis we could do that, excuse me, Dennis. We could do that, but the, the items that you've mentioned, um, the, as far as uh, the floodwaters or any flooding that comes in from the ocean, the, the dune that we're proposing is one foot higher than the existing grade for a space of about four feet. It's basically just to stop those waves and let them break over the top of it before it hits the existing lawn area. So we're really not creating something that's going to prohibit any floodwaters from flooding. I mean, it's, it's, it's minute, it's basically one foot. And then the second item is, as I mentioned to Louise, you know, we're matching in on the le easterly side, what's there, and on the right-hand side, we're just gonna turn into the wall that's there. So yes, we could go back and ask for continuance, but that's basically <coughs> what I'm gonna say in the uh, in I understand, but I think what we need on the record is for you to address those four or five criteria that we set forth at this later hearing um, for the record. I think that is important from a, from a due process point of view, from a consistency point of view on the part of the commission. I think it's a pretty de minimis project, honestly. 
and, and I hate to ask for additional work, but I think it's important more for the commission than, than for anything to have that record developed before ruling on this. That's where I'm coming from. Dennis? Uh, yeah, I, I think we have to do you a little careful, John, because we haven't actually adopted anything yet in terms right. of the flood zone. Um, asking the question is reasonable. Um, we also have to decide whether we're going to distinguish between different types of, of um, methods of dealing with floods. Um, the other project that we'll be looking at on later uh, involves a <coughs> permanent berm, vegetated berm, where this, at least on the appearance, uh, appears to be a sacrificial dune, you know, which would contribute sand to the littoral drift uh, along, along the shore. So I think, in fact, in the regulations, if we adopt a regulation, we may distinguish between the two cases of a possibly allowing sacrificial dunes where we wouldn't allow permanent berms. But again, th th it's all up in the year, and so I think it's, it's fine to ask the question, but at this point, it, we can't require anything because it's not, we don't have a regulation to deal with it yet. That, that, I can respond to that. Can you speak in the mic? That's true, we don't have the regulation, but at that, the, the prior hearing and the one that's coming up tonight, um, absent a regulation, we said, look, at, in these kinds of situations, this is what we right. want to look at. What I was just, the only thing I was saying is, I think Maybe these th are there's a dif difference, difference between a, a sacrificial dune and a permanent burn. Okay. That's, could, that's that argument I could accept, yeah. as long as yeah. we understand Right. That. There's yeah. also a difference in terms of the, the situation. I mean, this is, this is a velocity zone, I, I presume. And the is it okay. yes, it yes. Is. yes it and is. and the uh, other situation is is a much more subtle shall we say uh, flood zone situation. Uh, the other one had yeah. multiple flood zones. I I don't know the difference right now without looking yeah. at the other. Darcy. Um, so I just want to state I did some research and there was a similar project that the commission approved. It was dune construction. It was back in 1996, but it was at 38 Great Bay Road in Osterville. Um, and it, it was a situation just like this where they constructed a dune and planted it with beach grass because what they were losing lawn area. What about the house right next to it yeah. that has this dune? Was that um, approved? That, there is no filing that shows when that dune was constructed. It, it just appears to, to be there. I did the research on it and there isn't a filing dealing that shows anything asking for the dune construction. I do have, um, I did bring a, a batch of aerials because I think there were some um, of the comments that came in stating that um, he had increased his lawn and based on the measuring that I did, um, I'll pass this down. I took two measurements from aerials from 2001, um, 1989, 2008, 2015. And um, the two areas that I measured, they it was like 55 feet from the house and 60 feet from the from a patio. Um, if anything, you know, they could be losing some, but they have not increased their lawn in, within those dates. Um, so the dune they that somebody built is built on the lawn, is what you're saying. So to, yeah, the, the question of the the neighboring. Right. Um, if you look at those aerials, that dune is has been there, and it seems to be. It's I can't find any proof that it was a created dune. Tom, this. There we go. Ahead. Um, Karen, I'd like to ask you a couple of clarifying questions. Um, the water, or the surge that comes onto this property, has any study been made to determine if it focuses on this property or if it's spread out ac across this whole beach area? I don't believe a study is done, but I believe the face of the, of the erosion is pretty consistent along there. So I don't believe there's anything special about our property compared to the other properties. So other properties get an equal bashing, if you will. Correct. Uh, and maybe the dune next door is, seems to be holding up the way it's, it's uh, and vegetation the, and, of doing next door and the one next door up. is not shown on your drawing so is that looking down at the property from the street is it to the left or the right standing on the street it would be on the um, right hand side right so it would be lot 203 
that area would be yes. where the, that, that would, that's a pretty good sized lot in there. Okay, so that's where the, the other dune is located. <coughs> and uh, uh, and you, you described earlier the amount of erosion that's occurred over recent time. Could you just restate that again, what you, to the extent you have any data on that at all? I guess to, to the extent we have data, there's limited data in what we have other than looking at some aerials, but one thing that's noticeable is that the irrigation system that was out there is now loose and sitting on the sand. So that irrigation would have originally been put in the, in the grass that was there, so it implies to us that they've lost at least 10 to 15 feet so over a small system, period of time. The irrigation system for the grass on your subject's property. Yes, is now right. loose, is okay. not and loose, that, but it's a... That gives me a little bit better perspective in general. I don't think it's rocket science, but it gets me there. You can also see erosion. When I was out there today, <coughs> there's parts of the lawn that are clearly eroded. And, cut. and you can also see those big irrigation heads, which I assume would be moved. Yes. yes. Pete? Yeah, I sit on the Sandy Neck board, and we're dumping uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of sacrificial sand there, almost on an annual cycle. Um, I see, Dennis, I'd have to certainly agree with you that what we have here is very soft sacrificial dune. I will make the mention though is that if you want to stop erosion, um, I'll tell you, lawn grass is not very good at holding the soil. I think that should be obvious to anyone. Their roots are very shallow. Um, having lawn right up to that edge is only asking for trouble. Um, having a sacrificial dune with some beach grass might help a little bit, but I <coughs> would suggest to the applicant that they consider some other kind of vegetation hold down your soil better than lawn grass would do. So I don't have any trouble with this very soft sacrificial dune planted with beach grass. I don't think we're setting a precedent. I think that it's about as soft a solution as you could get. Um, doesn't involve or doesn't uh, starve any down uh, transport sand motion. In fact, it's actually adding sand to the the coastal system, so I don't see really any negatives associated with it. Louise? Uh, the longevity of the uh, dune to the east speaks well for that soft solution. Any more questions from Commissioner? Any public comment? You want to come up and identify yourself? Would you like my name and address yes, on please. here first, or? Yes. Bill Quinn, Jr. Yes. I live at 11 Second Way in the neighborhood. I'm about 800 feet from, no, about 1,000 feet from the, uh, the property in question. I have a couple of questions. I know that town council offered you not to let people speak to the neighborhood rights, but when are we gonna get a chance to speak to that? Your, your, your deliberations here this evening directly impact our rights that were guaranteed in 1939, which predates any conservation commission or any conservation laws in the state of Massachusetts. Well, what the town attorney is mentioning that we are, can only looking at our jurisdictions, and we cannot get into the matter on terms of the, you know, the parcel rights, the deed rights, the easement rights. So, Dennis? Uh, what the, the town attorney's office has said is that this is a matter of private issue between the party, or among the parties. You know, we have to act on our jurisdiction. And whatever rights you may have to the beach parcel, that's something you would have to, you know, but settle on your own in, in civil court, I guess, but it's not part of our jurisdiction under the Wetlands Protection Act. We, we, can, we can do that. You had a question also about um, the dune uh, to the east of that one. There's a lifelong neighbor, Wayne Bassett, sitting in here. He has lived in this neighborhood all his life. If you want some instructive uh, input, ask him to come up and tell you about those dunes. They oh, shift every yeah. year. Yep. He has to volunteer, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll twist his arm for you. <laughs> He's my neighbor across the street. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I, 
I would ask you to postpone this and right a wrong that was done, I don't know how long ago, the last time anything that was permitted there. The lawn that you're all questioning and now the gentleman presenting tonight has already admitted that the sprinkler system is now waving in the wind is already encroached upon the old dune area from the 80s before the expansive lawns and swimming pools, et cetera, that was put down there. My wife and I walk the beach. Well, I, I don't walk it as quite as much as she does, but she's down there daily. We can't stand to see the stupid signs that are put up, but that's another issue for another time. When can we have our input? How do we, we, you mean to tell me that we have to hire a lawyer and go to court to stop you folks from encringing upon our rights when it's pretty cut and dry that in 1939 they designed the bathing beach, they defined the bathing beach, it's in all of our deeds. How can you have the right to say, yeah, plant the grass there and impact my rights to walk, my white rights to use the bathing beach? Okay, um, I was the one to speak with Attorney McLaughlin um, when he made the statement that Chairman Lee read into the record. Um, there's a pending case up in Boston when this was brought up dealing with the 133 Sunset Lane. Yes. And if, if, if and when that comes, the judgment comes down from Boston, then that, that would be the thing that would end up um, stating whether somebody has to remove lawn or in that in that situation, but it's uh, I'm it's aware not, of that, Mr. Englander. Okay, also, it, so represents it would be the some same case. Something it would ha it would be just like that. It would have to have somebody taking a case up to Boston and fighting it. Whether it this is this it it's basically the same type of situation because it's the same stretch of beach that everyone is talking about. Okay. So, so if you allow this to go forward tonight, and in three months, six months, nine months, whenever that is that issue is decided and it's decided oh you shouldn't put anything in there will you go and have him remove whatever is put in there with the same enthusiasm in other words we we want some guarantees that whatever's right and just will be it'll be fixed later on we wouldn't be the ones enforcing that that would be something that would be coming down from the court if, the, if, if the, you if you if postponed it, it tonight if the court were to order that you had protected rights, then the matter would have to come back to the commission with a revised application that would guarantee you whatever the judge decides. But that's a matter of, of private litigation among the parties. You know, we can only enforce what is part of our jurisdiction, and that matter is not part of our jurisdiction. Your private rights to beach are not covered by the Wetlands Protection Act. That's a private association, I guess, that there was developed. There is no association. It's well, however, the 1939 thing came about, whatever rights were given to property owners, that's not part of the, protected by the Wetlands Protection Act. So if you have some rights, then you've got to be able to enforce those rights through private litigation, not this commission. It, it seems counterintuitive to, com to complete this and We're then not have to go land back. Court. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Can you identify yourself? First? My name first. Good evening, my name's Anthony Densesky, reside at 76 Second Way in Barnstable. Uh, I believe, I'm hard of hearing, but I believe it was read into the record at the beginning of this hearing that the town attorney issued a statement to this committee, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, we would request if we could uh, very quickly pick up perhaps from Dorothy a copy of that letter. Is that possible? Yes. Yeah, just to make a clarification, it's a statement that I wrote after he said something on the phone to me. So, yes, I have one copy because I just 
typed Thank it out. Thank you. It and was, it was five minutes before I came over to the hearing. I got a chance to talk to him again and confirm what we talked to about before. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Also, I'd like to thank you for your help uh, over the weekend. It's uh, a very short notice when a meeting is called on November 21st. The next day is Thanksgiving. It was posted in a town clerk's office at 10.21 in the morning. So it never got out on the internet until Thanksgiving. Count up the work days that are after that, and that's the reason why some of the copies that came to you had the word copy written over them. Uh, there's quite a few neighbors here. I think if perhaps like the old King's Highway, you gave a large notice, the room might be even filled with a greater amount of people. One other issue, I, I sort of heard that there's supposed to be absolutely no discussion about the um, civil side, um, but a question was asked from, by Bill to Dorothy and then came back about the date of the hearing. Uh, the court was to render a decision on the matter that's in the uh, land court, which the only issue remaining is define the word of the use, word use in use the bathing, bathing beach. That was supposed to be done November 16th. Uh, the uh, person that resides in that house had the misfortune of being indicted by the Department of Justice and arrested by the FBI on September 5th. So the land court, if you could understand, Instead of giving them the six months extension they request, the land court gave them an extension until February 5th, fairly short time from now. Uh, one thing to keep in your mind, it sort of takes pressure off everybody. Let the land court make their decision, which would help everybody in this matter and uh, sort of take it out of the hands of the other lawyers. Uh, I thank you very much for your time and Dorothy, I'll catch up with you tomorrow, probably. Thank you. Thank you. Any more public comment? Please come up. Please sign on the sheets and yes. mention your name. Yes, my name is Fred Terrell, and I reside at 68 Second Way in Barnstable. I have been a property owner here f for 52 years. I just wanted to clarify one item with you, and I really appreciate your work. We, knew we need conservation more than ever, and so you're doing great work in that regard. There are two lots involved in the Mr. Casasas property. The one that's borders Sunset Lane, which I believe is lot 183, yep. and the second lot, which is on the beach, which is the gentleman speaking to, uh, is lot 2. Oh, 2 I think. Yes. And the point is that the second lot, 202, is part of the bathing beach. And everyone here has rights to that property. So the question you have to decide is, does a private citizen have a right to build on property held in common? There's already been an encroachment by added grass from the line of his property, the 100-foot property line, and the flagpole has been put in there. It's the only place along the entire beach from Millway past Locust Lane that has grass all the way down because that's what they put in there. That's what they wanted. Now they want something else. But they never probably had a permit for that. The point is this lot that they're talking about addressing with a berm is common property would interfere with the rights of people coming and going on the beach just to have the good common use of it. Th think about that in respect to the cases that were brought up in terms of the court. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you. Dennis? Uh, my question for the applicant is, does Mr. Casasa own that parcel 202? I confirmed reading his deed yesterday. According to his deed, he owns both those parcels. Does anybody else have ownership of 202? As far as I know, there is no ownership. There is a right to use the baiting beach. But as far as I could find, there is no record of ownership other than Mr. Casasa. All right. Th this commission can deal with the owner. If he owns the parcel, we can condition it. If there are other owners yeah, who don't consent, that's a different story. But so long as he's the sole owner, 
we can condition the application. John? Yeah, all we're ruling on is the conservation issues relative to putting this berm in. That's all we're ruling on. That is good. And even if we approve it, it does not mean that if he doesn't own the property or if it's common property, that's a separate issue determined by the court and the court could say, wait, you don't own this property, you can't do anything on it or you have to take it out. That's what Tom means, the chairman means, by saying we have very limited jurisdiction. We're just asking what is the environmental conservation issues relative to putting in this berm. That's all we're ruling on. It doesn't give an approval to go ahead and do it except under the conservation and the Wetlands Protection Act. That's all it does. Right. You understand that? I do understand that. If okay. I could just add one other item. This land is registered land, which means a judge decreed that my client owned this land and that nobody else owns this land. But that's an issue subject to go fight it out somewhere else. If you're right, you're right. If you're wrong, then he can't do it. All we're saying is from the limited perspective of conservation, what is the impact of this dune on et cetera? That's all we're ruling on. Okay. You mentioned that you have a piece of paper to showing that the owner owned lot 202. It's the land code certificate of title. Do we have a copy of that? Can we get a copy of that from you? We can, um, I don't know if I have it with me, but we can definitely provide a copy to you. Yeah, you have to call, you have to provide a copy for us to make sure that it's owned by the same owner. Then we, our decision will stand too. Yeah. But if that matter was subject to litigation, it's subject to litigation. I understand. We're not ruling I'm not, that. I'm not talking about that. All okay. I'm saying is that I just need a piece of paper okay. no, to show the great. owner owned that lot 202. That's all. I just want the, I think it's critical, and Dennis was saying that, that, that all you folks understand, <laughs> please, we are not saying, yeah, he's got a right to build this under the law because of ownership or whatever. All we're saying is what is the impact of doing this on the environmental issues confronting us in the town of Barnesville. That's it. Big difference from a lawyer's point of view. Right, Mr. Ford? Just <laughs> <laughs> say right. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> uh, Any more so? comments? No. Motion to approve the project. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I won't speak as a lawyer, because of course I'm not, but I'm a hunter and fisher, and there's a uh, certain rights that I have in the state of Massachusetts that allows me to go anywhere below the high water mark. And so someone cannot put a no trespassing posted. Yeah, I, I don't and being a, a fishing and fowling, not a hunter and fisher, that includes shell fishing. It actually includes bird watching. That is a fowling. It has been decided that you don't have to pull a trigger of a gun to be a fowler. You can be a bird watcher. And if you are in those pursuits, of fishing and fowling, no one can tell you that that beach is private. So that's just a, uh, a state of Massachusetts uh, blessing that fishing and fowling has. And navigation. Um, fish and, and navigation, and navigation yeah. Navigation. On the intertidal. Yeah. yeah. Not, it doesn't below, it's not just below low tide. No, it's Intertidal. below the high tide. Yeah, it's below the high tide. Dennis? Motion to approve the project as submitted subject to receipt of a copy of the title uh, for the staff file. Second. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Five to one. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Approved unanimously with one abstention. Tom, you gonna go back to Seth? Or yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> our, our guest, Seth Wilkinson, is here, so I'd like to bring it back up in terms of land subject to coastal storm flowage. Seth, before that, I will let Dennis to talk about We got a the, document coming down. The preamble stuff that we're gonna talk about. Do we have this already? John, you have, I have this. Seth, here's one for you. 
You got one. All right. One. There we one go. More. One for Doug. So one for two. Peter, too, yeah. This is for Peter. Thanks, uh, Seth. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little tired. Got in at 2 o'clock this morning from Thanksgiving trip to visit the grandkids and with flight delays. I'm so it's a little. Oh, boy. Uh, you know how it is. And I want to thank Commissioner Abadili for dumping this in my lap before I <laughs> went on vacation. Uh, 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 you said to keep it simple, and that's what I try to do. We're dealing, we're looking at land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, the DEP has been talking, as you've told us, Seth, for a long time. Uh, they now, I guess, ready soon to start distributing some draft regulations and then for a public comment, and then it's going to be months after comment, and eventually, maybe a year from now, whenever, to actually put it into effect. And we know that one of the things that they were doing in order to start to draft a state regulation was seeing what the towns were doing, and that eight towns had already adopted under their local bylaw or ordinance, uh, had adopted a local regulation dealing to land subject to coastal storm flowage. I'm just going to call it the flood zone. And the acronym there doesn't flow off the tongue very easily. Uh, those towns were Chatham, Duxbury, Hingham, Mashby, Tisbury, Wellfleet, West Tisbury, Kingston, and Oak Bluffs. And so I was charged to come up with a document. I looked primarily at uh, Wellfleet's and Chatham's, uh, they seem to be the most well-developed, and um, also looked at some documents from FEMA and Coastal Zone Management and the DEP. So what I, what I would like to do with your permission is to, since this is not a public hearing, it's a workshop for the commissioners, but it's, you know, eventually if we decide to propose something, it would go to public hearing. So why don't you let me just take a few minutes with your indulgence commissioners to go through it and then uh, get some comments from Seth uh, and then comments from commissioners and see where we go with this. Uh, I set this up just like our dock regs and uh, uh, buffer zone regs. So <coughs> 712, it's proposed chapter 712. Uh, preamble, section A, the Conservation Commission's authority to regulate, I'm just gonna call it a flood zone, is established by both Mass General Laws Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Town of Barnesville Chapter 237-2A. Quote, no person shall remove, fill, dredge, or alter any land subject to coastal storm flowage. B, the flood zone may include, but is not limited to coastal beaches, dunes, marshes, banks, meadows, coastal swamps, flats, or other lowlands in the coastal floodplain. The flood zone lies at the margin between upland and land subject to average tidal conditions. C, the flood zone is important for the control of floods, storm damage, pollution, erosion, and sedimentation, as well as providing for the protection of water supplies and wildlife habitat. D, the flood zone with a natural topography slows down storm flood events, providing frictional resistance to floodwaters, reducing their energy and destruction potential. However, buildings or other obstructions can channelize floodwaters, increasing velocity, and providing additional flows to adjacent or upland areas. Buildings constructed with their living or, and or working space above flood, ele flood elevation can allow floodwaters to flow unimpeded below through pilings or piers. E, reducing vegetation in pervious areas reduces surfaces that can detain, absorb, slow, or evaporate waters, thereby changing the drainage characteristics in a manner that could cause flood damage on adjacent properties. F, constructing solid retaining walls or permanent earthen berms at a project site in the flood zone will divert additional flood waters to adjacent properties or to upland areas that otherwise would have less impact from the storm effects. G, Flood zones immediately landward of marshes, dunes, and coastal beaches may need special protection because as sea levels continue to rise, these areas become transitional with coastal resource areas migrating landward. 712-2 definitions. A, 
Land subject to coastal storm flowage means land subject to any inundation caused by coastal storms up to and including that caused by the 100-year storm, a 100-year storm having a 1% chance of being equaled or exceeded in a given year. B, special flood hazard area means the area of land in the floodplain that is subject to a 1% chance of flooding in any given year as determined by the currently effective Federal Emergency Manage Management Agency flood insurance study or rate map. The flood zone consists of the FEMA V and A zones. Um, I'm going to need some help on this later, S Seth. There were lots of A zones and AE zones and AO zones and A1 to 99. I just took the basic description from FEMA tried to go with that, but I, I got a little lost here. Uh, the, uh, the flood zone consists of FEMA, velocity, and A zones. The V zone is the area of a 100-year coastal flood with velocity waves that have a height of three feet or greater, a run-up depth of three feet or greater, and are within the primary frontal dune, the first dune landward of the beach. Two, the A zone is separated by the limit of moderate wave action into the coastal A zone, into the coastal A zone with wave heights between 1.5 and 3 feet, and the A zone with wave heights less than 1.5 feet. Three, the X zone, which consists of a B zone, 500-year flood, and C zone, minimal flooding, are not in the uh, land subject to coastal storm flowage. There's a very nice drawing. I gave credit to FEMA, MassDEP in coastal zone management because I don't know who drew it, but so I gave them all credit. 712-3, commission review, A. The commission presumption is that the flood zone performs functions for storm damage prevention and flood control interests. B, the commission will assess how the flood zone functions at a project site. C. The Commission will consider whether the project adversely impacts these functions and interests. D. If adverse impacts are found by the Commission, then the Commission will impose conditions to contribute to the protection of the interests. If the impacts are found by the Commission to be de minimis, then no mitigation will be required. However, more than one otherwise de minimis project in a specific area may have a negative cumulative impact on the ability of the flood zone to contain flood waters and buffer upland areas from storm damage. 712-4, regulations. Any activity proposed in land subject to coastal storm flowage shall not, one, reduce the ability of the flood zone to absorb or contain flood waters. Two, reduce the ability of the flood zone to buffer more inland areas from flooding and wave damage. Three, to displace or divert flood waters to other areas. Four, cause or create the likelihood of damage by debris to other structures on land within the flood zone. Five, cause ground or surface pollution triggered by coastal storm flowage. Six, reduce the ability of the resource to serve as wildlife habitat and migration corridor through activities such as but not limited to the removal of substantial vegetative cover and or the insta installation of solid fencing that does not allow floodwaters to flow through nor provide six inch clearance underneath for this passage of small wildlife. B, and that's where, this is where it, it came in. Yeah, I can see that now. Sacrificial sand dunes that allow for the littoral drift of sand along the shore are exempted. C. These regulations notwithstanding, the Conservation Commission will consider any and all uh, flood zone proposals on a site-specific basis, disposing of each according to its merit and to the degree that the preponderance of evidence shall show that the statutory interests have been preserved and protected. So th that's my initial draft. I welcome, Seth, your comments on it and to please give a guidance on the definitions, if I got lost on the zones there somehow and there needs to be further clarification. Thank you very much for, for volunteering to do, 
do this. So we really appreciate your expertise. Happy to do it. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, Seth Wilkinson, Wilkinson Ecological. Uh, quick disclaimer, I think you all know this, but I don't want to be accused of, of playing a coastal geologist or a coastal engineer on television because you know I'm not either of those. Neither am I a, a certified floodplain manager, but I do work with these folks every day and I've, I've been rather immersed in these regulations for the last uh, couple of decades. Um, and as I stated at an earlier meeting, um, I, I have been involved in the rulemaking process uh, at the state level among many other experts, uh, some of whom you, you do see from time to time in this room. Um, and it, it's an it's a expansive group. Uh, folks like MACC and Mass Audubon are represented at one end of the spectrum, and the commercial uh, real estate developers are, are represented at the other end, and lots of state employees in the middle, um, and folks like myself and engineers. I don't know where we fall. Um, but but uh, it's, it's a, it's a the, the collective um, Brain trust is, is impressive when, when everyone gets together, and I, I, I believe we've been meeting for more than two years, and it, it's, I think we're on our 13th or 14th meeting. We thought we were, we'd had the last one recently, but we were just told we have one more uh, in the next couple weeks. So as you stated earlier, um, it, it is nearing the end of the committee process. It will go out for, for comment. I didn't get clarification if I can share this with you tonight, but as soon as I do, I'm happy to do that. I, I, it's not you know, top secret. I think it's just to avoid confusion if various versions start floating around out there that just is not good for anyone. Um, but I can definitely share things with you that um, there's been broad consensus on in the commission, on the, on the committee that we've been on, and I, that may be helpful to you. Um, I, I think you, you've done a great job here. Um, I also have had some experience in some of the towns um, that uh, do have these floodplain by bylaws. We, we do quite a bit of work in Chatham, um, and, and I did want to make sure that the commission knew that um, the town of Chatham actually op opted to uh, invalidate their coastal floodplain regulations. Um, I agree, coastal floodplain, much better, much better name. Well, why? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, why did they? Uh, well, that, that's, it was a town meeting vote. Um, I, I think the general consensus was um, that uh, among the professional community, um, they were being extremely rigid in their um, uh, regulation, particularly when you all recall the FEMA floodplain maps were updated. Um, and that's one of the, the things I always recommend to, to towns is make sure you understand the extent of this. If you haven't already, look at your GIS maps and understand how much this additional work and regulation this may cover because um, unfortunately we're going to be seeing a lot more and more with sea level rise, a lot more and more area that's going to be part of the coastal floodplain. That's just an eventuality regardless of which one of the models um, come true. Um, and so uh, particularly in Chatham, there, there was a heavy emphasis um, on wildlife habitat protection within, within the um, coastal floodplain, which uh, I'll use that too if I can, instead of the mouthful mm. of acronyms. Um, uh, and when that became expansive in areas which were hundreds of feet from the coastline, with the, when the maps were reviewed, so to give you an idea, the planning uh, department in the town of Chatham froze the maps and they said, whoa, this is a big change. And so we're gonna freeze our regulations to the old maps, give ourselves a little more time, work through this, and and that was met, I think, with uh, um, appreciation from the public. And uh, I, I don't, because I don't work in the zoning and side of things and the planning side of things, I don't know where that is presently. I think it's, they're still working in the old maps for, for zoning purposes. Conservation said, nope, it's FEMA, we follow FEMA, and, and they did that. And then um, the outcome was they, there was a, a, a majority of folks at town meeting uh, decided to invalidate that section of the regulations. So they no longer have that protected. Um, so, uh, and interestingly enough, it, right at the beginning of the rulemaking uh, process, uh, and it was um, Gary, I'm forgetting Gary's last name, he used to be head of Audubon, he used to, I think, also be a director at um, DP back in the 80s, um, very knowledgeable person, and he was there representing Audubon, he said, I don't think we should include wildlife habitat in the protection. And I said, what? <laughs> why, why would Audubon say that? And, but I think, I think Gary's a, a pragmatist and he, he said, you know, th this will kill it in, in the legislature. This has to go through the legislative process. And we've already protected wetland, you know, we've already protected wildlife um, habitat in other, in other areas. And I have some ideas on that that I, I'm happy to share. Um, 
And you know, granted, you, your regulations don't have to go through the legislature, I, or maybe town legislature, but that's certainly not as complicated as state. But, um, but, but that was the decision that the state has, has chosen not to further protect wildlife habitat as a, as a, as a function within um, the, the coastal floodplain. You can choose to do it, you're certainly within your rights. Um, I would propose that you consider an alternative way to do that, and, and I, I really commend you, particularly in, um, in the preamble, section um, G. Um, personally, as an ecologist, I think that the most important function of the coastal floodplain uh, is to be that, become that transitional area uh, for for landward migration of coastal resource areas, particularly salt marshes. I think that's, I think if you can protect that function in a similar way in which we protect the function of dunes, we don't actually protect wildlife habitat in dunes unless it's, unless it's nest, nesting birds. Um, but there's actually not, people don't realize that. We think of that as like one of the most heavily protected resource areas, and it is. But what's protected is the function. And I think you could probably do more by protecting the function of that resource area to serve as an area for salt marsh, namely salt marshes, to migrate into um, and, and do far more benefit, I think, for wildlife than you could by just sort of doing it the old-fashioned way. Uh, and, I, and I think you've already, you have already done that pretty well. So just something to consider. Um, because personally, I think that's, um, and, and I, won't, I won't belabor the, the sea level rise issue, um, but, but just in case everyone hasn't seen the most recent, which is only about a month ago, the IPCC study, the International Panel on Climate Change, um, the extreme model is, is rather shocking, and that's, that's, I think, generally considered the gold standard with modeling sea level rise. It's three and a half meters in the next 80 years. Um, that's over 10 feet. <laughs> that's a lot of coastal floodplain. And, you know, it's, it's easy to discount. That is the extreme model. I think there's, there's, there's low, intermediate low, intermediate high, high, than extreme. So it is the extreme level. But the intermediate level is 18 inches in the next 20 years. And that, that got my attention actually more. Um, I plan to live a long time, but I don't think I'm gonna see, uh, ten, I hope I don't see 10 feet of sea level rise. Um, but, but 18 inches in the next 20 years, uh, if I keep taking my vitamins and get some exercise, I, I might see that. And I don't, I don't really wanna see that either. So, but I think, we, I think you need to be thinking about that when you're developing these kind of regulations. And it's important, I just wanna say that at the outset because that's a, that's a very uh, heavily uh, researched topic now and, and I think those are, those are pretty reasonable numbers. I think it's pretty, pretty well accepted. Um, so you're, you're looking at a lot of this and the types of projects that I think you're gonna be seeing that you may not be thinking about in these, kind of, in these kind of regulations because it's not the majority of the projects that you see, but there's gonna be a lot of retreat. And I think one of the things, certainly we, we, we figured that out over the two year process that we had to be careful of is there were some inadvertent obstacles that we're, we were putting in that no one realized until we sort of gamed it out a little bit. And again, that was because we had so many different perspectives. Different people would look at it from different perspectives and have some thoughts. Um, so for example, um, I, I really didn't, uh, other than just to commend you on, on Section G and the preamble, I thought the preamble was, was quite good. Um, there, is, there is reference to wildlife habitat in the preamble. Um, and then... Would you like, you, your recommendation is to, to delete that? Well, I just think you should be very clear. I, my, my recommendation is you consider protecting it, but not explicitly by calling it wildlife habitat, but by focusing a little bit more in G and maybe mimicking G in one of your regulations that isn't there now, and, and don't just uh, uh, reference it in the preamble, but, but convert that, as we often do in the preamble, into a regulate, in, into something, into a function that's protected. And, and I think that, um, you know, because not every, not every area in the, in the um, coastal floodplain is going to serve as a migrant. I mean, if there's no salt marsh seaward, there's no, you don't need to protect that. But in areas where there is salt marsh and you've got, you know, land that's at the right elevation, um, I think being able to protect that is really a big difference that the town could make in the future. Because we're going to need our salt marshes more than ever, and they're going to be stressed more than ever with sea level rise. Uh, so following up on that, uh, what would be your recommendation to, tr you know, translate item G in the preamble into a regulation? Assuming that we, you know, drop regulation six, A6, um, how would you see re a, rewriting, a, it. rewriting yeah. it so that we provide a, something that 
that deals with the, the matters discussed in G under the preamble. So something along the lines of uh, areas, uh, I, I, would, I, I would recommend getting specific. I would speak specifically to salt marshes because, um, you know, uh, a dune, dune migration and salt, migration, salt marsh migration, you could choose to protect both of them, but you probably want to do two separate regulations because they function quite differently. One tends to be driven more by aeolian forces and another's more littoral. Um, and and uh, they're, they're just different enough that you might want to take them on separately. So let's just focus, I would, I would recommend focusing on salt marshes. And so I think you could say something in areas where um, salt marshes have been uh, identified as a resource area, um, areas landward, which which could serve to be suitable transitional areas uh, for these resource areas to migrate into, um, sh that function shall be protected. I'm sorry, it's not the exact language, but something along those lines. Um, and, and you may want to look to specific language in, in how we protect that function in salt mar in, I'm sorry, in coastal dunes. Um, but then adapt it for, for salt marsh. But it doesn't have to be terribly complicated because you're, you're, you're just trying to protect a function, a, a function of an area to serve a specific purpose. Um, so if it's, uh, you know, if it's got a one-to-one -one slope, you know, salt marsh isn't going to grow up a one-to-one -one slope. We know, we all know that. Um, and, uh, or if there's a, an existing uh, rock revetment or, you know, some, some, some existing structure in the way, you don't need to protect for that. But in areas, where it's you know undeveloped land at a at a reasonable slope, um, at a shallow slope, um, that 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 might be something to consider. And I think I think the wildlife benefits from doing something like that um, would keep you out of the, the frankly the rabbit hole that I've seen projects go into in other towns where it's just sort of well we generally protect wildlife habitat in these areas. I, 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 when you did mention wildlife habitat, you gave some real specifics: six-inch clearance underneath fast small wildlife. You know that's 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 nice to see, but then it also it, it leaves the door open for other areas, and and you know I think it's important with regulations. Th this particular board, I think you've always you've been among the most um, dedicated and consistent um, uh, board that I that I come before that really sticks to your regulations. You don't wander from them. That's relatively rare these days, <laughs> in my experience. Before I appear for a lot of commissions. Um, they get kind of creative with their application, and I hope that never happens in Barnstable, but I think you want your regulations to be tight enough so that, that it can't really happen easily. Um, so that that might be, uh, uh, I, I think function is easier to protect than something that's really broad, like wildlife habitat. You know, what kind of wildlife? Is it wetlands related, or is it all wildlife? And that varies from town to town as well. Um, so I, I could, you know, I, I'm not very good at writing um, uh, rules on the fly, but I, I'd be happy I to work with, with it gives us some something clue. along those lines. I think converting from from G in the preamble to to a regulation to to potentially replace that could be uh, beneficial. Um, uh, item C under a regulation essentially is a waiver procedure that allows us to provide waivers, and we do grant waivers from time to time, yes. depending on the nature of the projects yes. that are in front of us. Um, so, um, the one thing I was going to bring up, we uh, ask the commission, Chatham and Wellfleet don't deal with this, but in our buffer zone regulation, we gave uh, waivers to uh, uh, municipal projects that uh, helped increase the, you know, um, water quality control and things such that, stormwater control. Uh, that's possibility you may want to consider as an exemption under our regulations. The other one that was in our buffer zone reg, um, uh, provided a waiver for um, uh, uh, marine businesses. Water dependent. Water dependent businesses. So even though Chatham and, and uh, Wellfleet didn't do that, that's something we may want to do here as well. But I, I, I would agree with you that, that we've, uh, that's something we've been working on at the state level quite a, quite a bit as well, is just not unintentionally rolling back regulations. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, um, we realized at one point we inadvertently made uh, coastal engineering structures, which are almost always in coastal land subject to flooding, right, because of what their function is, inadvertently made them illegal. And, and that's really, that was, that was important for the passage of the regulations back in 78 and sort of the 
quote unquote grandfathering um, that, that uh, you all know the history on that, so I won't, won't be belabor that. Um, but that, you know, we checked with DP, that, that wasn't the intention. We're not trying to change other aspects of protected areas. So uh, making a few clarifications like that may be helpful. Um, you've done some of that, but, but possibly a little bit more. Um, because some of, when you get to the actual regulations, some of them I think are a little bit broad, which isn't necessarily a problem as long as there's other language which puts some corners around it. Um, so I mentioned the, the, the CES. One, one of the issues I still have at the state level that I plan to bring up one more time is because they specifically spoke to, to CES, you know, where they can otherwise be, you know, meet the regulations, which we know is a limited amount, uh, they, they gave that special uh, consideration. But then they didn't mention non-CES. And the whole reason I was on that committee was because of my own expertise in the the non-structural engineering, and we, 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 had, we had covered it in a couple areas, but actually when reviewing it again to prepare for this meeting, I realized that there's one section, the State Act, where we still, it, you know, read a certain way, it actually make, it encourages people to do CES in the coastal floodplain rather than non-CES, and that's not at all where DEP is uh, from a policy position. Um, so you may want to just reference that um, uh, things like non, uh, structures, uh, coastal engineering structures such as bioengineering or living shorelines, there's lots of different names now, nature-based um, stabilization measures. Um, you, you may want to reference that you're not trying to regulate, further regulate these with these regulations uh, because someone could say, well, that might uh, reduce the ability of uh, LSCSF to absorb or contain floodwaters. Um, it, you know, basically A, B, C, and D are, are broad, um, which I think is the intention, but you could potentially create some confusion, I think, because, you know, if like we looked at the one about um, uh, D uh, under regulations, uh, cause or create likelihood of damage by debris uh, Seth, I don't think you have the, oh, the current, I, am I the current number. So I have my notes on one, yeah, and, and then a, I was just handed it I realized one. after I'd done it that I hadn't <laughs> yeah, numbered it correctly. Yeah. So uh, Okay, so let me go to the right one. Sorry. Um, it, so it's four now. So A, A4 under the regulations. Um, so I don't think it's your intention um, to create additional regulations on, say, docks and piers, but someone could look at that and say, well, geez, you know, if you put one more dock, there's a more of a there's a higher likelihood um, of, of you know debris because you've got something in, in the in, you know which could come loose a piece of it could break off and damage uh, so you know maybe tightening up and saying provided you know best management practices you know are are uh, um, implemented in the construction of coastal engineering structures docks and piers you know some of you know, the, these uses that are already permitted under certain conditions in certain scenarios under other areas of the regulations. Um, you, don't want, you don't want to give away the farm, but I think you know, using that best management practice uh, caveat sometimes helps to, to give you the right balance of, you know, make sure it's nailed down as <coughs> sturdily as we can get it. And then um, we, hope, we hope it doesn't, uh, but, but there's always going to be some debris <coughs> in a storm, right? We just, that's just a reality. Boats break free and they become storm debris. Um, so, so just to, you know, that was, that was something um, that, that, uh, that did, uh, was one of the lessons we learned um, when we were running this through different scenarios at the state level. Um, sorry to jump back a little bit, but I did miss one, one note, a very simple thing. Um, I, I think, and I'm not, I, I'm afraid I'm not an expert in all the different limoirs and uh, memoirs and all that stuff that, that Dennis was struggling with, which we all struggle with, but I, Everything I read in there looked consistent with, with what I've seen elsewhere, I, I, so I don't see a problem there. The only thing I felt um, needed to be included was the landward, I'm sorry, the seaward limit of this particular resource area I think should be defined. The state defines it very clearly as uh, mean low water, which I think is reasonable. Um, after mean low water, it's uh, land underwater, and probably at that point these standards don't, don't make a lot of sense in open water condition. But I think just just to make it clean, that, that's a simple change which you could just include because uh, you've defined the um, the landward extent of it, which is probably more important. But seaward extent sometimes becomes important as well. Um, I'd certainly welcome any uh, you know 
when you've had a, a time to reflect on this, if you want to put any of your ideas into writing and, and send them to the chairman, uh, that would be a big help. Sure. I've been jotting down notes as we've been doing this that uh, I may not have the, everything uh, completely. Obviously, we, as we were doing this, uh, as I was doing this, uh, <laughs> I was not trying to <coughs> prevent pre, in 1978 structures, th those lands are protected by other parts, and so we're gonna have to make that clear that we're not yeah. impacting that, but also that we're, I think the commission would recommend soft solutions wherever possible, so. But thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, yeah um, just a point of clarity. He has a question. Yeah, I, 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 is anything else right now, Seth, that uh, pops out at you? Um, I, I'm happy to take a break for questions. I, I'd like to just circle back, and it probably a little bit, you know, towards the end makes more sense, but uh, I'd be happy to share some of the uh, exemptions um, uh, and, and a, a actually a limited project status, which is probably too complicated for a local bylaw, but there were, I think, some, some things which came out of the state process that might be valuable, but I can come back to that. I can briefly go to the buffer zone regulation to the exemption section. For example, we wrote in the buffer zone regulation that pro projects undertaken by a governmental agency that can be demonstrated to provide an overriding public benefit, such as the area-wide improvement of water quality or the reduction of ground or surface water pollution, that would be exempted. Uh, and also the construction or reconstruction without intense expansion, no, that doesn't apply. Uh, the other one is the construction of water-dependent facilities as defined in 704-2F. So, um, um, I think that's great. I think that's great that that's, that that's there. Um, <coughs> why, don't, why don't I, uh, I don't know how you want to, whether you want me to keep going with this, Tom, and uh, ask for other commissioners' comments? Pete, Pete? I have some comments yeah. on that. Okay, um, I, when you talk about wildlife habitat and migration corridor, um, Seth, I'm going to respectfully disagree on the limitation uh, of our interests to landward of existing salt marshes or um, outside of the Great Marsh of Barnstable and going out to the Outer Cape with Chatham. Not much of our shoreline is actually consists of Spartina marshes. And so I think that would greatly limit us if we, if we limit our functionality or if we limit, you know, through functionality, we limit habitat to Spartan only. So whether we have, um, I think we recently had spoken of a particular kind of habitat that uh, is a maritime meadow, I think, or something like that. We've, we've had that recently. And so I, I just strongly disagree with only sticking with Spartina marsh as a habitat that we think about in the future. As opposed to including other, other options, other wildlife options that might be unique to the Cape or that we have high value for because of the species that live there. Um, you know, thinking more natural species instead of invasives. So uh, just a word of sort of a hesitancy on my part with that limitation. Another thing that I, that it's under definitions B, special flood hazard area. And I, and I, I brought this up to my students uh, regarding uh, the devastating effect of Hurricane um, Florence down in the Carolinas. Um, South Carolina and or North Carolina, I'm not sure which one, but the legislature specifically exempted um, the, the current FEMA maps from the assessment of, of flood potential damage in the development of much of the coastal plain, allowing, of course, in the last five or so years, a lot of development where it might not have been because it's in the current FEMA, um, resulting in a whole lot more property damage down there. So Dennis, where you have determined by the currently effective federal or FEMA flood insurance study, I am perfectly good with FEMA, but if we have 18 inches or potentially more over the course of decades coming our ways, I'm rather expecting FEMA to be revised. If, right. we, if we say that our regulations apply to what FEMA was in 
2018 or 2020. By the currently effective. Oh, oh, oh so whatever is, is effective, effective at that. Means. Not, not the one that, yeah. thank you. Yeah. That's, That's my confusion. Or oh, you can use the wording, the latest. Yeah, we're we going to revise it. currently it effective, that that's what that means. That's not meant the one of today. No, right. no. My ignorance in English. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'd welcome other commissioners who want to join. Uh, just a couple of thoughts, yeah. Dennis. Um, the, this uh, Regulation B, the sacrificial dunes, which we talked about tonight right. in that hearing, uh, we're saying they're exempted from these regulations, but they're not Want to make in other they're words, they're not exempted from conservation review no, of those projects. No, no, just the chapter seven twelve four regulations. I can I can put those numbers yeah, in. Yeah, just to clarify yep. that, because as I read it, I said, yep. wait a minute, exempted. That means mm. you can just go ahead and do it, and we're not saying that. So, right. So that was a minor point. With regard to C, and this sort of relates to something that Seth was saying. If we added something like uh, proposals on a site specific basis, which is language we have in all the regs. Um, and added something like inconsistent with other Conservation Commission regulations, would that cover that, the issue that he brought up? So I thought doing that. I do think we should add something about the municipal projects, yeah. right. um, yeah. maybe even that. the water dependent. I'm, yeah. I'm struggling understanding this application, but. Well, and, I mean, and if you were in a marine business right. area and they were business building a boat area. shed and type of thing. So I, I think adding those <coughs> two would, would be a pretty good addition. Yeah. Um, beyond that, I, I think you, you did a yeoman's job. I'm glad I recommended it. Thanks you. a lot. <laughs> you should have do that again. <laughs> Larry, <Larry's> soon. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dennis, I concur that you've done a great job, and you've, you've um, avoided my tendency, and that is to go on and on. <laughs> um, but the, the, I'm looking at the Wellfleet version, which, while it rambles, it has a lot of interesting points in it. And I think that maybe when we have our commission workshop in more detail or discussion, we can decide if some of those should be at least discussed. And, and, and But the only question I have for you or suggestion is in 712-3, number D, I recommend that that be broken into D and E or D parts one and two. Uh, I recommend that the first sentence be clarified a little bit uh, because it says the protection of the interest. That sort of maybe could be made a little bit more specific as to what interest okay. you're talking about. Um, and that, as a result, that specific uh, phrase or sentence may deserve to be expanded a little bit further. Uh, then part either E or two would be, if the de minimis, then that would be a separate one. It would, might, in my view, would read a little more clearly. Uh, and what John just brought up with respect to uh, other regulations that we have enacted or may enact in the future. Uh, Seth brought up an interesting point. What about a dock and pier regulation? Would that have an impact on this? And my thoughts is, uh, are we talking about prioritizing another regulation over one? In other words, does one regulation for one thing carry more weight or does it, does it um, override the effect of this? Is this sort of a, a, a cover all cover up for thing or does it all to be, to be the, the, the dominant I, I, I think it stands on its own, and I don't see Doc and Pierre having oh, an impact not. on that. I'm this. just using that yeah. as an example. I know, of what he said. I know. Yeah, but I'm just raising that to be considered. If it's helpful, the state is looking at it as sort of an overlay, um, so that it. And in, in, in I, th I think the way yours is worded, actually, you, you could read it that way as well, because it it recognizes it can. This can be on beaches. It can be in intertidal. It can be in coastal banks. It can be in a lot of different different. It's because it's dictated by elevation, a specific elevation more than anything else. And so where that elevation lays, it, it's additional regulations on other and isn't necessarily meant to change the, the, the underlying allowances or restrictions in those resource areas. So y you may, and I, I think you need an attorney for that, which I'm not at that either. But, um, but that's, if it's helpful, that's, I think, the way that the state is looking, looking at it, is it's a layer of regulation. I, I think what we're, we're doing here, this is sort of like a first take. And depending on where the state comes out, obviously we can't be less stringent than them. And so we may have to revise this language once we see what the, the state is going to require. Which we could be a long time. Well, we're talking maybe about a year. It's about to go into the legislative process, so it's a little open-ended. But I'd say, yeah, for planning purposes, around a year. All right. Okay. Um, yep. I just have one quick comment, yes. though, is under the 712-3B, the commissions will assess how the 
flood functions at the property at the prop at the project site I am proposing to add at its effect on the neighboring parcel so just looking at the whole thing because how is your flood water going to affect the neighboring uh, parcel I think that's and, a good idea. yeah and how it affects the neighboring parcel yeah that that's also been a, a point of, of discussion at the state level and, and I think the consensus has generally been and its impact yeah. to the chair's part. you know position as well um, e even for the projects which are are going to be allowed you know more than municipal or even larger than municipal regional scale projects which are being considered mostly in the Boston area um, that it will be permitted provided it doesn't exacerbate the neighbors <laughs> um, and I think that's a good measure for, for when you're thinking about things that find their own <coughs> level. John. Seth, do you think we need a regulation under the town or town ordinance? Um, I, I think that the f I think that they're challenging by nature, um, but I, I I do think that the coastal floodplain would benefit from um, some uh, uh, additional regulation. Um, I, but the other side of that is, will the public benefit by this? I, I think they will, and I think what you see in these instances, in 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 FEMA's documented this, and others have documented this, that um, it might be onerous when you're going through the regulatory process, but you see the benefits after a storm. You know, I mean, there was a study in New Jersey where they you know, really invested with a lot of the soft alternatives, and they and they um, put a lot of sacrificial dunes in place, and and the, the Superstorm Sandy hit them pretty hard, but the damages were far less than communities that hadn't invested in that. Um, so, uh, you know, however you can encourage folks to move towards the, the softer uh, approaches and the planning uh, of, for, for sea level rise, and the, you know, that, that's the take home message I'm trying to give you is, is really be thinking about sea level rise yeah. a lot when you're thinking about these it, regulations. It's been my experience over many years on the commission and somebody who has written some regulations here that the be one of the benefit of the regulations is it clearly communicates to the consulting community which allows that community to, to say to their clients, right. hey, this is what we've got to do. This is pretty clear. Right. It makes lawyers like Mr. Ford very happy because they've got something to look at. And I think there's a real benefit to that. But on the negative side, I have found that no matter how careful we are, no matter what we do, you cannot envision when you know the bull runs through the room on a rainy Sunday, and eventually that comes up and it bites us. Yeah. Um, and we've seen that multiple times. Myself, I tend to favor this approach, and I think I think the simplicity of it, Dennis, is very valuable uh, with, with the additions we've talked about. So I kind of favor it, but. It can come back and yeah, and, and this you know, and I agree. The simplicity and, and the clarity uh, are the two things you should be striving for. As I said at the outset, to also really look because we've got such good lidar-based GIS data now. Look at the area you're going to be. Yeah. Uh, we did that at the state level, and it was shocking. I think every single person on the committee was shocked. It's going to get at, worse at the area, and it's yeah, it's, it's not going to it's not going to get smaller. It's going to get bigger. So just just know what you're what you're <coughs> in for, and then. Um, again, I think you all know I'm an advocate of wildlife habitat, and I'm not, not trying to minimize it, um, but, but I think, uh, to Commissioner Sampu's point, you know, so if you, if you want to protect specific habitat, you quantify those. You know, there's the, uh, it's always a mouthful, but my conservation biologist taught me, and I might, might have been um, what was referred to, but there's a fresh brackish, fresh, fresh brackish tidal troubling community, which is we're losing. You know, it's an important habitat type. And that, you know, but, but so, so, you know, be as specific as you can if you do want to regulate habitat, where I think the towns like Chatham, I think, did run into trouble and some other communities were into trouble. It's so open-ended. Uh, the town of Chatham literally says we protect skunks as wildlife, um, which, which jumps out at a lot of people. Because <laughs> uh, they're not a wetland, you know, dependent species. Um, you know, so, so that was one of the things, I think, where they sort of, I think you could learn from, from their history in that regard. Because uh, I don't, I don't, I think, you know, a, a, a more reasonably uh, applied regulations in Chatham would have really, Chatham's got a lot of low-lying areas. They had some substantial flooding issues in certain parts of town, which now are basically unregulated. Uh, so that's, that's, that's really, I don't think you can say that's the best thing for the town of Chatham. Um, I, I'm happy to go into the, the exemptions, and I, I, and I can summarize these pretty quickly, uh, and I think I will be able to share these with Darcy, and, and these might be helpful because a lot of you have touched on this. Would, would that be appropriate sure. just to run through these quickly? Absolutely. There's, there's seven. Um, so they use language, let me just read the, the, the beginning. Um, 
The issuing authority may permit the following activities provided that the applicant demonstrates to the satisfaction of the issuing authority, that's you guys, the best available measures are utilized to minimize adverse effects on all critical characteristics of the LSCSF and provided that all other performance standards for underlying resource areas are met. And then they list so these, these seven areas. Uh, beach dune and bank nourishment and restoration projects. Um, you know, including fencing designed to increase dune development and plantings compatible with natural vegetative cover. Um, there's more, I'm not, I don't want to belabor it. Uh, ex elevated pedestrian walkways and elevated decks with the appropriate height and spacing between planks to allow for sufficient sunlight penetration for vegetation um, and to allow dune movement and migration. Um, it's another one that, I, again, I think there'd be broad consensus that you're, you're not looking to limit those. Uh, commercial or public boat launching facilities, navigational aids, piers, docks, wharves, and dolphins. That's not the mammal, that's the structural dolphin. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, we're because again, statewide you're seeing, and I think the Cape's gonna see this as well, just a lot of landward retreat. And, and so uh, I think you need to have the allowance and your regulations. You may be moving from a really exposed area in the coastal floodplain to a more appropriate place. It may still be in the coastal floodplain. It may have to be because it's water dependent. Um, but you know, you just wouldn't want to have a regulation that allows some clever attorney to come in and undercut a, a good project, whether it be for the state or a private entity, I think, in that, in that matter. Um, number four is improvements necessary to maintain the structural integrity stability of existing coastal engineering structures, uh, provided that the improvements minimize the adverse effects on wetland resource areas by minimizing the size of the improvements and minimizing the potential erosive effects of the improvement and that any portion of the structure located on a coastal beach, uh, coastal dune, barrier beach, or coastal bank meets the performance standards uh, for coastal beaches found at 310, blah, 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 blah. Um, five, a project with, which will restore, rehabilitate, or create a salt marsh or fresh water wetland. Obviously, you're not trying to stop those. Um, projects that are approved in writing by the Division of Marine Fisheries or conducted by the Division of Marine Fisheries that are specifically intended to increase the productivity of land containing shellfish, including aquaculture, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then lastly, projects that are approved in writing by the Division of Marine Fisheries or conducted by the, the DMF, um, I'm sorry, DFW, that are specifically intended to increase or enhance a wildlife habitat. Um, so again, I, I think I can share those with you in writing. I appreciate so it because I, I don't do shot yeah, in and yeah, there's no yeah. way I and could I, get those down. And so. I talk fast. Yes. But, but just to give you a flavor of, I mean, I think those are the types of things you're not looking to inadvertently regulate. Oh. Um, oh, so, okay. you know, might as well use the use what the states come up with in that, yeah, in that regard. I'd appreciate it if you'd send them. Yes. I, the, the situation is that, you know, recently we've had kinds of applications for trying to stop floodwaters from coming into areas in, in, in flood zones, <coughs> and the commission has not known exactly how to deal with those. And so since the state is moving towards that regulation, we're trying to figure out how to do it ourselves on the local level to be consistent and to, to protect the flood zones so they can do what they're supposed to be doing. So that's why we've sort of gone down this road. We, I mean, we're just at the beginning, yep, yep. but we're trying to find our way here. In that vein, I would, I would offer another place where there's been broad consensus, again, across the entire spectrum of the 20-something individuals represented, um, that there's a very, when you're dealing with the coastal floodplain, it's very different than the inland floodplain when it comes to compensatory flood uh, storage. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it sort of makes sense, sense if you think about it. Um, if you're in a riverine situation, you're in a basin, you're in, you're in some sort of confined freshwater wetland, uh, you, you really need to preserve that. That, that compensatory flood storage. That's one of the issues of the Mississippi at a very large scale. It's why the flooding gets closer the further down the river you get, it gets worse. Um, it's not the case with the ocean. It's all de minimis, de minimis when it comes to the ocean. You don't increase flood elevations by taking away flood, uh, compensatory flood, except for in very isolated and confined, you know, artificial situations, occasionally natural, but very, very unusually. So it, it just if it's helpful, that's one of those areas where I'm comfortable saying there was broad consensus, there was no argument. There was plenty of things we argued about over the last couple of years, but that was not one of them, that there was broad consensus among all the scientists and the regulator, regulators on the, on the uh, committee that, that, that compensatory flood storage was not something that needed to be protected, except where it's very unique situations, and then you may want to consider it. 
Thank you very much, Seth, hey, for pleasure. coming out tonight and helping okay. us. Where do we go with this? Yeah, well, uh, Tom, uh, do you uh, want me to try to make okay. revisions and? We'll get the re we'll get uh, Seth's comment to us, mm -hmm. and then we can kind of revise it. Do you want to on our next agenda have a continuing discussion as we try to uh, edit this document? It does, you know, I, um, I know you don't have to okay. be here all I was, the time. I was going to say, so. I, I've got a, a NOAA conference on the West Coast coming up, and I, I, I've got to prepare for that as well. So I, I may need a couple weeks before I can get, get things back to Darcy. I also have to get some permissions from the state, which sometimes takes a little bit of time. We, uh, we can we send you tape, our. You know, hmm? We also have the tape as reference. Yeah. We can, you know, yeah, the DVD is also available, but, you know, um, we can send you uh, our document as we revise it for your your reflections on it and uh, make sure we're uh, seem to be going down the right path um, it also it perhaps at our next uh, meeting we've got to get on with our agenda here but at our next meeting uh, we might invite uh, the consultant community uh, for any um, information that they might want to share uh, but I would suggest mr. chairman that um, we continue this on uh, December 4th, maybe at the end of our afternoon session. Usually our afternoon sessions, we have some waiting around time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we could continue on okay. talking about this. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Seth. Thanks, Tana. Thank you. We'll go back to the uh, Thank you. agenda. Henry Blair to permit the use of hydraulic dredge for maintenance for maintenance dredging of Millway Marina to permit a second dewatering basin for larger amount of dredge material produced by the hydraulic dredge, repair existing wooden bulkheads at 275 Millway Road, <coughs> Constable as saw on the assessor's map 301, parcel 063. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, again, my name is Kieran Healy. I'm a land surveyor with the BSC Group, representing Mr. Blair, the owner of Millway Marina. Um, as you mentioned, we are looking to uh, create a revised dredge plan, permit hydraulic dredging, and a new dewatering basin, and repair an existing wooden bulkhead at the site. Um, there have been permits issued in the past for this property um, to do pretty much exactly what we're looking to do. Um, the only real modification from the last permit the town issued was the um, size of the dewatering basins. Um, previous dewatering basin was done for um, basically a grab type of system where um, a hydraulic clam just goes down, drops in, and picks up and drops it over to a certain area. As that is happening, a certain amount of water is leaving the bucket, and I'm sure Mr. Gilmore can educate us all more than I can on this. Um, but a certain amount of water drops out of the bucket. So as a result, when it gets to its disposal or its dewatering site, there's a lot less water in the actual sand when it gets dropped out of the ground. Um, when we do a hydraulic dredge, um, everything has been pushed up, both the water and the uh, sediment has been pushed up to that dewatering area. As a result of that, we need a larger area for dewatering um, because there's more water to actually be taken out of the the sample of the sediment as it uh, drains out. So you'll see on our plan we have a, a larger area up in the parking lot, um, well away from the actual edge of water itself to dewater. And um, other than that, the project itself is exactly the same as previously permitted. We are looking to um, fix and replace any of the pilings that are underneath the building that uh, support the building and allow us to dredge up against the face of that um, if you look at the sketches, you can see how we're looking to come right up and basically have a vertical wall 10 to 12 feet deep um, right up against the face of the building to allow us to be able to get the water right up against that. Um, we're not we're looking to replace all of the existing wood or pilings, just looking to replace what, when it's exposed, what will need to be um, replaced. Other than that, I'd be glad to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Towards the end of the day, um, I had a discussions with Darcy. Our concern is your permits on the dredging permit expiration date issues. 
So we send the emails to Matt. To I, I, I am, that, I am privy to that. And Matt and I both disagree with your interpretation. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we're looking for a new notice of intent so that we can put any disagreement behind us and basically start, from, start fresh on this. But in our mind, the way we read every single order of conditions that's issued by this town, there is an item that in there that says an order of conditions will expire after three years. And in there it says unless other permits for maintenance dredging exist with an approved water quality certificate. We have a water quality certificate that goes for another five years. So in our mind, in our interpretation, we believe we have another five years under that order. And it's not that we want to disagree with the town. So a portion of what we're doing this is to put that behind us, move forward with a proper new permit so that you're happy and, and our client is happy. I'm not sure whether you guys understand the, the questions. The question is because they have a, a valid license under the water quality permit, I mean water quality certifications, but from the town side, when they extend the permit, they thought that they had it, so they did not expect they did not renew their permit, the local permit. So that's why, to me, it's kind of lapse the permit. What does the what does the what does the order say? I mean, if you write relevant to the words, does it say what he just said it said at the end? Does it? Does it say unless three? It expires at three years unless. Does it say that? Um, I don't have that in front of me right now. So I read it uh, two hours ago with Matt. We sat down. We went through it word for word. And we, that's how both of us interpret this particular language. It's item number four on the order of conditions. Do, do you have that with you? I don't have a copy of it, John. No. Darcy, yeah. you don't have it? Just one minute. Item number four is it, Are you talking about item four under our special conditions, or is it four in the, in the general conditions? General, in general the conditions. General conditions, not specific to your specific conditions. Yeah, I, I only copied the special conditions part of it. I think because Matt came one time to another hearing and this came up, that we've been kind of in the policy that when somebody has the maintenance dredging and they come in and they say first the the first request for three years, second request, and then somebody will come in and say, well, okay, this is our third third year request. And that's when we make them appear and the commission makes a decision. But we've always had it that it doesn't give it a, a carte blanche that you can do it without the third, third year request. So it's to me, we better look at how we're drafting it. <laughs> right. But in any case, to file this so that the. Right. So nothing to keep us from. It's, it's a moot point. Right. <laughs> yep. You filed this. As I say, we want to work with the commission and make the problem <coughs> go away. So. Uh, just so you know, this wording is actually in the DEP portion of the conditions. Right. It's not in the bounceable specific conditions. Okay. So this is in every con every order conditions. And that's what we kept saying is it doesn't, even though that's what the state says. I spoke with everybody and it was like, okay, no, we're dealing with the with the bylaw. How you feel yeah. under the bylaw? Right. Right. So, so I um, George. Yeah. Um, had a lot of experience with this site myself 20 years ago um, I dredged this clamshell method we we took the material down to the town bulkhead loaded on the loaded on scows took it down to the bulkhead and trucked up and we prepared a basin basically where your big basin is right now um, my question to you is I just roughly figured that large basin um, with a capacity of about 600 cubic yards when it's full. Is that roughly what you came up with? Um, I'd have to check the, check the plan. It's not, I don't see anything on the plan. <clears throat> no, I didn't see it there. Then I won't disagree with you. Okay, well, okay, the, my point I guess is, so the large basin is roughly 600 cubic yards when it's full. Uh, the smaller basin is about 120, so you've got a capacity of 720 cubic yards. Um, <coughs> 1,500 yards to be dredged, obviously, you do some, you dewater, you sit for a day, and you, I assume you're going to 
pump this material into the primary dewatering basin um, until it's full, probably uh, let it sit for a little bit, dry out a little bit, throw it in the secondary basin to dewater more. Is that the idea? That would be the idea. Use yeah. the primary first till it's out of capacity and then use the secondary if needed. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. This, this, is, this is just a permit, so in the event when we're doing Oh, you're going to need it. <laughs> you're going to need it. Um, I just, hydraulic dredging, you're going you're gonna to be pumping, especially in here, although there's, it's pretty sandy in there, so you'll probably pump about 80% water. Yeah, 20% sediment, that's yeah. what we expected. So you, you're going to have a lot of, a lot of run back in. Um, you're going to fill that basin up with a hydraulic dredge real quick. Uh, and then you're going to have to sit for a while. But um, the other question, and I, it was funny because as I read Tom Marcotti's email today, um, and he said at the end of it something effective, uh, boy, I can't wait to see this, or I can't, meaning the use of hydraulic dredge in such a limited space, it's, it's going to be a tough, tough go. I don't say it can't be done, but um, I guess you've answered my concerns. Any other comment? Larry? Is this, a, is this a new one, Karen, or is it, a, are you requesting a, going to withdraw and file a new one? I'm, I'm a little confused on that. We're filing a new one, but we haven't requested to withdraw the old one as of yet. And part of the reason for that is that it takes a, a lengthy amount of time to get through the state and federal permitting. We believe that's still in effect. So rather than come into foul play with the town, we want to be sure that we were covered, but the old one will still be the, in, the initial permit that's going to run through the state to allow us to do the work sooner rather than later. So what are we supposed to do with this one today? We're looking for you to approve it as a new notice of intent, and as soon as we can close the old one, we will close the old one. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have grain size analysis uh, down core from any of this? My question being is certainly the surface looks pretty sandy and potentially has use for augmenting some beaches. Um, what is your planned use of the dewatered dredge material? I believe it's going to be chopped off to another site, and I honestly can't tell you where that site is. Discuss, but I, I just don't know at this time where that mm. I can check with the, you know. Okay, I, I just think that you, you might have different grain sizes as you go down, and I think the utility and or the cost for disposal depend, is dependent on grain sizes and Possibly. characterization of that, that spoil. So it's just a mm -hmm. suggestion yeah. that. I you will check into it. The water quality stuff was issued, so the grain yeah. size would have been done at that time. Yeah, to, yeah. To I didn't see that. it in the, yeah, so didn't see it I in can this. definitely check into it and see what the It just is. might be useful for you all. Luis? Well, just to follow up on Pete's um, point, I mean, how many times have we considered projects and it's like, oh, we're going to have to bring, we have to find the sand. And um, we've had discussions along the lines of, well, could we take these spoils? Would they be appropriate for some other part of the town? And c can we get them there conveniently? Or you know, do you have to build a train? And and therefore, it's it's uh, impractical to use. But we we ought to be looking around to see if someone else in the town can benefit from from whatever is coming out. Dennis. Yeah, I believe at a recent uh, town council meeting, uh, director of DPW, I, I think it was him who was speaking, was talking about problems at Blish Point. And here, this you're going to be very close to that. Yeah. And, you know, this this sand, if it's a good quality, as you said and Pete says, you know, it would probably be very helpful to them. So I don't know if you've had any conversations with DPW, but they may be a interested customer. We can definitely reach out because you know, Blish Point is literally 500 feet, I know. Uh, a thousand right. feet away. So right. we can definitely reach out to the DPW. Um, I don't Please think do my client will have a problem. It probably would be cheaper to dispose of it on the beach anyway. So yeah. um, I don't think anybody would have an issue with following up on that. George. Yeah, my, my understanding is that <clears throat> because it's dredge material, it's either got to go on a beach with proper grain size 
um, but it's got to be specifically stated, I think, in your water quality certificate that it's actually going on that beach. Otherwise, it has to go to a certified disposal site, and you're going to pay through the nose right. to have it disposed. You're going to pay by the ton. Right now, I think it's, uh, well, last time I dredged, it cost more to dispose of the material than it did to dig it. So if you could take it to, I mean, if it would be a great benefit to the town. If it's, um, uh, if it's compatible. If it's compatible, which I, I'm sure it is. Some of it is. Um, well, it is going after, you know, you're going to get a lot of, a lot of the fines are going to come out of that with the hydraulic dredging. So um, it's probably going to be compatible for the beach, um, but it would have to be something you'd have to obviously work out with the town and, and uh, with your water quality certification. And that's one thing we would be afraid of is the length of time it would take to get the water quality, quality certification updated or revised yeah. to allow that. I'm not saying we want to look at it and, and look into all of that, but uh, that's one concern. They couldn't have. do that under revision under your existing water quality certification? We can have a look at it. Yeah. Same. That's you can talk to them and see whether they would take, give it your consideration or not. Yep. I will definitely follow up. So on the comment letter, there is two comments, one from Tom McCarty basically saying that the second dewatering basin should be large enough to permit for the larger amount of the dredge material, just like Josh said. And then secondly is the existing wooden bulkhead is to be repaired. There's a DMF comment letter saying that the project site is within the mapping of shellfish habitat for brood mussels. Subtitle water within the project sites have habitat characteristics suitable for this species. Um, DMF has also identified the abutting ACEC designated Barnstable Harbor and surrounding embayment as winter founder, spring habit. Winter founder air enter the area of spring from February through June. Um, Barnstable Harbor is also mapped as a horseshoe crabs spring mm -hmm. area. Horseshoe crabs deposit their eggs in upper intertidal regions of Sandy Beach from late spring to early summer during spring high tide. So the letter offer a number of comments. So I'm just <coughs> going to read that in the record and see whether that would be in the special conditions. A time of a, a time of the year restriction is recommended on all in water work from February 1st through June 30th to protect the winter founders' sprawling habits habitat and horseshoe crabs development. From the plan, it appears that the proposed stretching will include the intertidal mudflats. Mudflats provided one of the most productive marine habitats for numerous marine species and are designated as special aquatic, si aquatic sites under the Federal Clean Water Act. The plan does not show the limit of over dredging the proposed dredge footprint with the overdredge is above the observed low water mark. Dredging of the edges of the intertidal mud flats will most likely result in slumping of the banks and it's erosion correct. of the intertidal flats. DMF recommends no intertidal dredging or dredging within 25 feet of the mean low water line. Reconstructions of the bulkheads should be limited to the footprint of the existing structure as much as possible. As much work as possible should be conducted from the upland side of the bulkheads to minimize the impact on the intertidal habitat. Fill spills from the refilling of the equipment will adversely impact sensitive resource area. If equipment is refilled on site, additional Adequate containment and cleanup material should be required. The barge should not be allowed to ground or remain anchored in shallow water for a prolonged period of time. Grounding will result in compactions of sediment and damage sensitive aquatic vegetation and animals. The barge or the boats service as the, as the accompanying power vessels to the barge could prop dredge fishery habitat if allowed to operate in water with less than with less than two feet of separation between the motor skate and the substrate. That's the comment from DMF. Darcy. Um, I just wanted to mention I did let Matt know that um, 
I talked to Brian Taylor to see if there were any waterway comments too. And um, one of the things that was brought up also about protecting the state boat ramp when this is going on and in the cleanup, can we make sure that n nothing gets running over on that side? Um, That's right. I mean, we will do whatever mitigation that the uh, commission would prefer. I mean, either straw waddles or a cell fence, whichever. Yeah, I think I need, think we need to have that in the special conditions. Uh, yeah, um, maybe have that indicated on a revised plan that it's going to be installed, and then monitoring every once in a while to make sure anything has to be cleaned up. Or just one other item, um, because of the locations of the buildings and the retaining wall is there, it's impossible to actually walk from the shore. There's just no way to get to, to get to the water. So one of the concerns was. One of the recommendations was walking from the shore, but that just is impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One other question. Yeah, George. Um, you showed, I agree with the state comment there on the dredge to, you got it as minus six. Does that include the over dredge? Um, no, that does not include the over dredge. Minus seven. Yeah. yeah. That, that's the way your, your um, state license reads? I believe so, yes. Dredge to minus six. Minus six, six over, over seven. Okay. Over seven. Any comment here? No. Any public comment? Let's see. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you said that there is, you were going to follow up on the possibility of the town benefiting from the dredge spoils, assuming that, you know, the, the grain size and everything is compatible. How are how is how are we going to close the loop on that? On that, how are we going to know what you found out and what's going to happen? Because I think that's really important. I, Mr. Chairman, I think the the most we could do in that situation is to make a recommendation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not a conservation issue. No. It may be a good time, well, which I agree with you. We can't tell them they have to do that, yeah. but we can recommend that they. You know, seek out uh, communication with the town. All right. Well, we can recommend it, but yeah. can't we ask to know what happened? Oh, they can inform staff our, what your decision yeah. is as to the disposal of the product. Correct. I mean, we can follow up with the grain size first of all to see it's compatible, then follow up with the town DPW, and then follow up with the water quality. And if all three work out, I'm sure that my client will be interested in doing. I mean, it saves something. you money. It would save the town money potentially because we're sure buying client, all this sand. I'm sure, my for client would like to save. Not that it's going to go to Sandy Neck, but. Okay. Sorry. I asked oh, public any public comment? comment? No. Uh, Darcy, did you have something? No, I'm, I'm just going to wait to see how many of the ones that were in the DMF letter become okay. special conditions. <laughs> um, I would move that we approve the project as submitted, subject to the following special conditions. Uh, we'll be including all of the DMF bullet points except the one which says uh, the work shall be conducted from the upland side. Yep. So all the others, including the time of year restriction, that's all right with you? Yes. Okay. Um, in addition, we're looking for a revised plan to show the limit of overdredge and to, um, we're recommending, oh, wait a minute, we're also requiring for you to protect and monitor the, is it the state ramp? The state ramp in consultation with staff and we're looking for the revised plan let's i got the limit of overdredge and i've just forgotten the other the revised plan was to show the the silt the fence, fence or the protection this, you got that one. okay got was there something else no, there and, then, and then the recommendation oh yes all right it went in and out of my mind uh we're recommending to you that you consult with the town in terms of the disposal uh of the um, the dredge spoils in either case whether that works out or not, you'd be advising staff as to where the disposal site is, is going to be located. Yes. That's my motion. Second. All in favor? It's approved. Uh, just you. to clarify, you'd prefer um, silt fence as opposed to straw wattles? Um, I'm fine with either. I, wattles is fine, too. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. Thank you, staff. Thank you. Thank you. Next NOI EM Crosby Bow Works.
demolitions of existing residents at 190 Breach Street and constructions of a two-story commercial building with gravel parking and paved boat washed down pad with recycling wash systems at 178 and 190 Beach Street. Also, we are showing the assessor's map 093, parcel 029, and 028. Good evening, John. Uh, good evening, John O'Day from Sullivan Engineering Consulting, representing EM Crosby Boatworks at this project site on Bridge Street, uh, which is just adjacent to the uh, Osterville Drawbridge. We were before you oh, a year or two ago um, for the new boat ramp, which is under construction uh, on the seaward parcel here. Uh, and at that time, we gave you a pretty good history of the family and, and what they do and have done in this area for hundreds of years now, which I'm not going to get into at this time of the day. Um, and I'm really just going to stick to our project, which is primarily focused at 190 Bridge Street. Uh, it's a site that's developed with a single family dwelling. Uh, the project is to demolish that and build this commercial um, building, which will be used for um, his, his boat works business um, and custom boat building, marine sales, storage, repair, and maintenance. Uh, the building is located further landward than the existing dwelling. It's outside of the buffer zone. Uh, it is in land subject to coastal storm flowage. Uh, it will be designed with flood vents and meet all the building code requirements for commercial um, buildings. Uh, <coughs> it is not under the building code subject to uh, floor elevation limitations like a house, so we're not going to be picking ourselves up. Uh, which wouldn't work at this site in terms of actually being able to drive boats in and out. <coughs> um, we do have a uh, boat wash recycle pad, which is the uh, industry standard now for marinas and, and many other uh, facilities that are dealing with washing. Uh, so we have a small paved pad shown um, between the building and the street uh, where the boat can come off the, the ramp typically on the trailer, pulled across it, the, the boat will be sitting on top of it. In the middle of this pad, there will be a sump, um, which a closed recycling system will be connected to. Um, and so that water will just be recycled, recycled, recycled through a, a filtration system. Um, within the buffer zone, the only work is uh, actually on the parcel located to the east, if we look at the property lines, uh, a small retaining wall, about two or three feet. Uh, it's about 85 feet from the coastal bank or revetment, uh, landward of the structure on, on that adjacent parcel and landward of the right of way, which leads uh, out to the Oyster Harbors Marine facilities. Um, we got about 15 feet of uh, gravel driveway parking area. Um, I think with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We don't have a copy of your architect drawings, so you should give us a copy in the I file. Can, I can least. take them off and hand them down. They can yeah. end up in the file. Any questions? John? John, uh, when you get back to the mic, are, are they intending to store, winter store boats there? Is there a place for the winter storage of boats? <coughs> um, yes, there will be storage of boats at the site. Uh, Whereabouts do they intend to store them uh, in this concrete pad? Uh, the, the gravel parking area, um, they can really be stored anywhere within that, what's shown as a gravel parking area. And is, is there an issue as a boat owner? Boats tend to leak gas and oil and diesel fuel and things. Is there a concern with that? I know a lot of yards obviously don't. They store them anywhere, but I'm just wondering if that's an issue, if you, especially if you're storing them in, in a graveled area or, or, or a paved area or a concrete pad area. Uh, I think that that is somewhat covered by stormwater management plan, which you probably didn't get a copy of, but was in the file and Tom reviewed. 
and which does require um, you know inspections of the property and and I guess that could be extended to all the things that are on it um, for things that that might be spills and, and such but uh, we're not you know the, the bulk of the the work that they're working on is the we are no seniors and stuff like that there's not a lot of power yeah there's, there's none but um, so uh, I'm not sure how else to, to respond to that except yeah, I I'm think not, it's fair not to sure be watched. How, how serious of an issue it is um, but no I just don't have a strong enough feeling for that well but doesn't this um, company deal with power boats as well they could I mean a lot of I think um, a number of power boats are serviced and maintained by this company, not just mm. sailboats. Including one close to you. Yeah. Mr. Bacon's. Right. I, I, I actually call them to store my boat for a period of time. It was one possibility. Yeah. I'll just say, I've been to Oyster Harbor's Marine many, 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 many times. Um, there are the asphalt paved lots, and you never see any, you know, in the wintertime. Boats are just sitting there doing nothing. I've never seen us. Yeah, that's why I'm not problem. sure whether, never seen a whether problem. I'm raising an issue that is an yeah. issue. That's uh, I don't think it's an finished. issue at all. Is there any concern about we're replacing um, some hardscape with lots more hardscape in terms of this slab? In terms of uh, it's it's a uh, you know most of it's an in area zone, prone to what? flood flooding and uh, it's a co but it's a, a uh, it, water it, dependent commercial it's going to be an exempt use under yeah. uh, our regulation if we adopt one absolutely yeah so I just have a quick couple of comments one I would like to get a copy of your detail if you have a wash down pad detail <coughs> and some and all that stuff it's just more for information stuff that we have and secondly I think in your job in their descriptions on page two basically under the standard eight you said the contractor shall be responsible I would I would want to add the owner and the contractor are responsible <laughs> yeah but that's I mean that's just standard drafting language I know not, I know and it's not the owner's responsible in the middle <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I kind of look at your stormwater stuff is just fine yep so I, I guess my only question on the um, Wash down pad. Uh, I assume that they are somehow pretty strongly connected to whatever the sump and the sizing of the sump, uh, whatever unit they choose to use. And he has specked out a couple of them. Yep. We obviously haven't bought it yet, so I'm not sure if that's something that you want before an order or before it's put in the ground. No, I think after you select the equipment, okay. then you can give us a before copy. Before it's installed. Yeah. That just yeah. want to be clear. Any more comments from the commission? None. Any public comment? None. Mr. Chairman, I would move to approve the project as submitted uh, with a special condition that the details for the washdown pad selected by the applicant be uh, submitted to staff before installation. Second. All in favor? It's approved. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> The next NOI High Enus Rotary LLC lifts tower and constructs new foundations under the lift portions of the existing dwelling. Construct new full foundation under septic system under septic system upgrade at 10 <coughs> High Enus Avenue. High Enus Port a song on the assessors maps to eight seven puzzle one three one. Good evening, Councillor. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. Uh, Mike Ford, Council for uh, the applicant. With me is uh, uh, Dan Ogula, who is the uh, site engineer. Dan has prepared the uh, notice of intent before you, uh, together with the assistance of Tim O'Neill. Um, Tim did the protocols uh, that are attached. And uh, Tim and Craig uh, Ashworth is also <coughs> here, who is the principal of the building company, E.B. Norris. Um, 
this is a special property. Um, it's located in the Hyannisport um, National Register uh, Historic District. Um, uh, this is uh, planned as phase one that's before you of a uh, complete uh, restoration and preservation plan of all three structures on this site. Um, the goal is to restore all of them in their original condition, including with the types of materials um, uh, that they're made of today. Um, because it's in the National Register District, I should tell you that um, the work that's being sought under this particular phase one order um, is also before your local Barnstable Historical Commission um, and we've made that application and, and they will be hearing it um, on December 11th. Um, the owners of the property also have an application pending uh, before the Massachusetts Historical Commission under their tax credit program uh, to do a complete um, uh, preservation project on all three of these particular structures. So the goal here is to uh, save uh, what is there and uh, which is why we're here tonight because there are some things on the site um, that the structural engineers and E.B. Norris have identified that need to be addressed immediately and they are the um, sinking if you will of the uh, building on the easterly side, the main building, as you're looking at it from the water, if you went out to the site, you can see that uh, that portion of the building in that corner um, is sloping um, uh, and sinking, uh, as well as uh, the water tower structure uh, that's on the site. Uh, that's uh, has even got more of, a, of an issue in that regard. And so what we've brought before you, and there's no intention to do any segmentation here, we just need to get some work done first. So I wanted to let you know what the whole project was and, and we'll be back for uh, a phase two, if you will, because uh, the goal is to um, fix um, uh, the large retaining wall that runs along the site that really will act as kind of the, um, uh, the wetland barrier for this particular project. Um, uh, we'll be back on that and we'll be back on some other things as the phase two restoration work uh, continues. So uh, uh, no intention here to try and segment everything. Wanted to give full disclosure. We will be back. This is phase one of the work, but it's work that needs to get done immediately. So there are three things sought under this first phase one. Uh, one is to lift that uh, water tower structure, um, move it approximately uh, 50 feet to the northeast. Um, and then uh, construct a new foundation within that existing footprint and then place the structure back onto the new foundation. Um, there will be some things that will be done uh, to the tower structure uh, uh, in, in terms of having to remove, unfortunately, some of the old stucco that's there, but the, the goal is, um, as part of the Mass Historic Commission project, uh, to restore all of that and uh, use stucco materials again that's going to be restored to uh, a stucco finish. So that's one thing that needs to get done right away. The second is the um, lifting of the easterly portion of the main building that I indicated um, at the outset. And um, that will involve uh, the removal of a couple of uh, windows and doors in that end. Uh, they're all shown on the plans and they're all listed in the protocol. Um, and then construct a full foundation under that section using uh, helical piles and a grade beam. And uh, uh, then obviously the structure will be placed on that new um, uh, foundation. And then third is to upgrade the septic system. Um, the septic system uh, was approved uh, three years ago uh, uh, by the Board of Health and, and Conservation, but that's expired. It, we need to re-up it. It was done in 2012. And um, it is the same um, plan uh, that was approved then. Uh, it needs a couple of uh, variances. And uh, Dan, is that scheduled to the Board of Health yet? No, we were waiting until we get through this board, okay. make sure the conservation resource areas were good, and then we'll file, refile with them. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll have a trip to Board of Health after um, you folks act on our, our request, hopefully um, this evening. Um, so uh, I think that's, uh, that's an overview of the project. Um, Dan has gone through the, um, uh, the local bylaw um, uh, sections. Um, we did meet, I should tell you, uh, with Darcy on the site to discuss the project ahead of time. Uh, we did talk about 
coming in with this phase one and then bringing the, the second part of the project phase two to the, the, the commissioners um, uh, later on. So that's kind of how we've, uh, we've structured the filing of, of this particular preservation project. But um, as I said, Tim is the author of that protocol. Darcy thought the key uh, to this particular phase one work was to provide a very specific protocol to the commission that you could incorporate in your order. And so we've tried to do that uh, for the phase one work. Um, and so that protocol and the detailed plans were included. So with that, Mr. Chairman, we're happy to take questions. Question from Commissioner? I just have one minor question, very, very minor, nothing to do with what you're requesting. On either a follow-up plan or the s plan, whatever, you need to tell me what the elevation of the retaining wall is. Right now, I only see two lines. I always like to know what is my elevation of the retaining wall, so you're not suddenly changing on me. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we will, we will be sure to provide that in a follow-up plan Do a spot. On, on phase two. Do a spot check. We'll on do spots. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it is a massive wall. You know, it's probably holding back 10 feet of earth, and then it sticks up another four feet above that. It's pretty rare. It, it's a, yeah, it's a in bad so massive structure. Yeah. yeah. So just take a spot. Great. Right. Start, but we will be back for work on the wall uh, yeah. for your review. Yeah. Any um, public yeah. comment? None. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we approve the project as submitted. Do you want that elevation on this revised plan or future? All right, I won't mention. Just uh, approve it as submitted. Yeah. Second. All in favor? It's approved. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Last NOI of the evening, Jane Ward and Steve Waller. Invasive species removal and management. Revegetated with native species, remove or pruned hazardous and or dead limbs of trees. Replace existing deteriorating retaining wall and landscaping step at 125 Bainstein Avenue, Cassandra View, at Song and the Assessor's Maps 229, parcel 108. Can you speak in the mic? For the record, my name is Michael Talbot, environmental landscape consultant representing Jane Ward and Steve Waller who are here tonight. Next to me is uh, Tyler Goodjo, our landscape designer. And um, this couple just recently purchased this property. They have retired as a physician for the Air Force and are now living in a, a very important piece of property, I think. And uh, they come with a lifelong uh, commitment to conservation landscaping. So what the property at the Theron here is on Long Pond. There is a um, small boarding vegetated wetland along the edge, the Centerfield River and the uh, buffer zone to the, to the river, the riparian zone. Most of the property is in that 100 foot riparian zone. So. What they want to do is, um, this is an old landscape, the house was built in the 70s, and there's a lot of invasives. They planted um, wing duonymus and uh, shrub honeysuckle, uh, Norway maple, other invasives, and other invasives are there. So the first step, we want to remove those, and once we see what's left, we're going to design a revegetation plan that will remove this section of lawn here, and, uh, do a few other small repairs, but mostly um, create a native habitat planting with various habitats, including a meadow area and some shrubland, uh, have maritime shrubland habitats. Um, and so basically the plan he is to uh, develop a landscape plan once we have removed the invasives, submit that to staff, 
get their approval and go ahead and do the restoration work. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Talbot, nice to see you again. Great it's been a while. You. Yes, it has. <laughs> um, I think in terms of the last several years, the commission has uh, looked at the the mitigation planting plans or the planning plans for the project itself rather than going to staff because staff has felt that it leaves too many questions for them to deal with. So um, if uh, we were to approve this project, uh, there would have to be some sort of condition where you'd be required to come back to the commission within a specific amount of time okay. with a replanting plan for us to look at and then uh, approve. That sounds appropriate. That was what I expected after talking to Darcy. All right, thank you. John. Uh, Darcy pointed out that it looked like one tree that was marked in the, literally in the water almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so on your plan, it's the one removed dying maple? Right. Um, so yeah, I had questions regarding how, I'm not so sure we wanna pull everything out. Like maybe we wanna leave a couple of cut. feet on it. And, and it would allow, allow it to um, come back coppice and uh, we'd probably plant maybe a tupelo or something in its place, one or two. So how far are you asking to bring that down? Um, to a stump level. So I just want to let you know that is in a wetland that he's right. asking for that. But, but he's saying, and it is dead, but he's saying he would simply cut it to oh. stump level. We're not talking about pulling it out, which would Right, be exactly. Okay. And the replanting of a floor or something next to it. Yes, exactly. The plan will include a replacement Overall, tree. the project it seems to be pretty good from an environmental point of view. Uh, and, uh, oh. I would just ask for three-year monitoring reports. Yeah. Um, and also, I think with this one, because we're working so close to the um, resource area, that we do want to have the condition that this is the only person approved to do this work is the, one of the certified. Um, yeah. No, the. No, the other. The oh. SERP. Yeah, SERP. Yeah. Right. The SERP. <laughs> right. Certified Ecological Restoration yes. Practitioner. Yeah. Right. Just so they make sure that they are the ones that are staying with the project. Uh, <laughs> Luis? Um, I'm, I'm curious, when did the uh, solar panels go in? Because. Um, Very recently. Well, I think the um, arrangement is that we are supposed to sign off on the building permit for. They did. So I did check in. It was just, well, August 2018. Martin did sign off on it. Um, technically, we're supposed to ask the question about do you have to remove right. trees? Um, I, I did not see that there was a question raised on that, but there you're are. only asking to limb, right? right. It's two not oaks. Two oaks. So yes. it's not that they're asking. We, we have it if they have to remove a tree, so it's different. Makes sense to me. Right. Yeah. Us having to so they did go through the process. Okay. I, I have a, and I sort of go back to Scott here, and what we're being asked to do, and it seems to be flowing through without any question, is to actually be removing dead trees in, actually, in, in the water, or at least within in the buffer, which we have hesitantly done in the past on rare occasions. Um, absent in front of this commissioner, the planting plan that will bring forth a improvement to the habitat, I don't have that in front of me. I am very hesitant about allowing what has generally been um, a habit that was not improvable. Essentially, the removal of even dead stuff provides important habitat for uh, tree nesting um, animals. Um, and so I'm, I'm a bit concerned about having a lack of a plan in front of me while I'm being asked to do a rather extensive removal of vegetation in our area that we're supposed to be responsible for and protect. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, that's a concern that I had looking at, you know, phase one, we're removing a lot of material, but we're not gonna know what we're gonna put in there 
until phase two, and, and it seems to me that they, both phases ought to be um, planned. And that's what I was used time. to in the past. Yeah. The reason we, <coughs> on this site, we chose to do it this way is because there are a lot of invasive species, and until they're gone, it's not going to be very easy to determine how many, what species will be appropriate to various locations. We're still locating invasive species we walk around the property um, and we're trying to identify native and appropriate species to keep um, the the one dead tree by the water is only selected because uh, it's very close to the house and the deck and they were concerned about safety that was it that was the only reason that tree was the other dead trees are old hemlocks that were planted you know maybe 15, 20 years ago that died of various causes. Could be delta, it could be drought. It's not a very well, not a very adaptable tree to the gape. Uh, Mr. Talbot, at first glance, I like your proposal. However, um, to temper it and to make it be more consistent with how we've dealt with these situations in the past, would you consider doing this in phases? Uh, the phase could be that you remove vegetation in one area where there's a specific population of invasives and things you want. You could draw, you could designate it, area A, B, C, whatever you want to do. Let that area then be cleared and then you come back with your, your plan to go in that area and then go to the next phase for removal. In other words, is this something you could do? It would stretch the project out a little bit, but it would give us a chance to react to what otherwise is a it's a fairly logical approach that you've taken from my point of view. That's, that's my question to you. How many phases would you oh, no more consider? Than, no more than three, it could just be two. Uh, but there's certain, this is a big expanse of property with a lot of circumference around the front end, what looks like the water of the northeast side of the house. So you may be able to zero in on certain areas that you feel are, or the, the new owners feel. I'm familiar with this area of Long Pond. It's, got a lot of overgrowth history and neglect for years. Yes. Uh, but that being the case, looking at your, your sketch up there, your plan, you could take the top part and that could be part A, the down the left side could be B, and then around the right side could be C. That's just a suggestion. And I'm not saying the other commissioners are gonna buy into this. I'm just trying to come up with an approach that may, may be able to do some of what you wanna do and still keep what we would like to see um, uh, protected as well. Is there a reaction? Do you want to answer those questions first, or you want to just take cons Well, we would certainly consider that. Um, it'd be better to do it in two phases, just for the cost purposes, sure. um, to maybe handle the area along the wetland first and on the side along the river, and then do the area in the back and on the, le on the right left side uh, second. Dennis? Uh, yes, I don't see on your drawing the marking of a, I may have missed it, the 50-foot buffer and the 100-foot limitation of, there. is it on here? Um, it's not. They didn't put All it right. on there. Well, I we staked it, but we didn't. Uh, what I would suggest plan. is that you revise this plan and then your phases be two, activity within the 50-foot buffer and then activity in the 50 to 100. Okay. And um, wouldn't, what sort of is your time uh, schedule for starting the removal of uh, invasives. Yes, um, we were hoping this fall. All right, then if we put, what would your preference be to work in the 50-foot buffer first? Yes, All I right. think so. If we <laughs> said, <laughs> you'd you'd have to. Do you want to come up? You'll have to you come want up to come up and phone. identify yourself? I know you're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jane Ward. Thank you very much for, uh, should I, do you want me to write this down here too? No? No. Okay. That's for comments. Okay. Um, I think the part of the yard that would be most interesting to, to see in the, uh, replanted phase is beyond the 50 foot. So you do the 50 to 100 first. Right, 
yeah, that's that. That would be the part of the yard that would be nicest to see um, <laughs> revised. I think. So if if we were to approve this tonight and say that phase one would be the 50 to 100, how soon do you think, you know, how many days would you need, 30 or 60 days to accomplish phase one in terms of Let's do 60 because 60. this winter is, being, is kind of uh, right. shaky. <laughs> so then a condition would be is that after 60 days you'd return to the commission with your planting plan for the 50 to 100. Great. And then sometime in, you know, assuming everything moves along smoothly, then in the springtime, uh, you'd bring you'd do similarly to the 50-foot buffer and bring in a plan for that. Does that work for you? That sounds great. Sounds great. All right. I have one more quick suggestion, if I may. To save you costs and efficiency, why don't you file a revised plan with phase one defined, your timetable in there, phase two defined, and let it come in all at once, and that we would rule on phase one now, and then you wouldn't be coming back with having to mm -hmm. revise the plan again. It seems to me that would be cost efficient, and, and if you tweaked it, then you're not looking at a yeah, significant the, uh, change. The, you know I mean? the phase two area would be easier to design because it's more open. Okay, There's well, one we're getting rid okay. of, and it would be easier to design without and having to And on this one, you may want to just reserve it as being reserved for phase two to be covered later. Louise. Um, just, just to be... Um, just for clarification, uh, when I was there, I noticed the stake for 50 feet was sort of at the, sort of, sort of in here. Correct. Is that right? Yes. yes. So you're talking about from, from, from there the on out. As the first. As the, the, as the first okay. area. Yes. 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 Yeah. Obviously, we're only conditioning what's in within our jurisdiction. Beyond 100 feet from the resource yeah. area, that's. You're free to do whatever you want out but there. But there's a lot of driveway and, and stuff right. within the 50 to 100. Yeah. That's correct. Part of our, our dream, if we can afford it, too, is to change this paved driveway into a pervious driveway. We've spoken to the people who do the, um, the rubber, the porous pave with the recycled rubber, and that would be phenomenal. Um, I'm not Good. sure if we can, if that'll fit in our budget, but that would be... That would be a, an aspect too. I just wanted to read in the comment about from the fishery and division of fishery and wildlife. The division has determined that this project as currently proposed to be not adversely affects the actual resource area habitat of stated protected rare sp wildlife species. On the that's on the wetland protection net. and then on the endangered species act is the same comment determined that this project, as currently proposed, appears to be exempted from the MISA review pertinent to 321 CMR 10.14. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I could not remember. I'm, I think I asked this question before, but were you asking for um, treatment of the invasives or was it mechanical removal? Most of the removal, especially in the um, phase one area, will be mechanical. There is a uh, row of of multiple rows along the wetland, and we'd rather cut that and dab it. Okay. And so that's in the protocol as okay. well, because okay. that area, I really don't want to disturb that wetland soils. Mm -hmm. Any comment from Commissioner? None? Any public comment? None? All right, Mr. Chairman, I would move we approve the project as submitted. We'll be looking for three year monitoring reports. Uh, annual monitor reports for three years. Uh, we'll be requiring that this project be under the direction of a certified ecological restoration practitioner. Um, we are dividing this into two phases. <coughs> Phase one will be the activity proposed within the 50 to 100 foot, uh, allowing for invasive removal, and that you would reach that you would return to the commission within 60 days to present a planting plan based on what you find after you remove the invasives. Uh, phase two would be a, a later project that you would return to the commission to deal with uh, the zero to 50. Actually, isn't the entire uh, 
property within our jurisdiction because of the river well, riverfront? Not, river yes, but the buffer zone, zone regulation only c covers the, uh, the, under the Wetlands Protection Act, the, uh, the buffer zone regulation does not apply to the Rivers Act. Second. All in favor? It's approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, starting with the $50 to 100 was, uh, was, thank you very much with, with that first step. Turn over the continuance to Dennis. Thank you. <clears throat> the first continuance is Marie M. Souza, Ray's House for FEMA Compliance, New Sewage Disposal System, and Associated Site Improvements at 168 Long Beach Road, Centerville, as shown in Assessor's Map 205, parcel 008. We have a, a email today on behalf of our client Maria Souza we respectfully request a continuance to the next hearing date scheduled for December 18 could I have a motion to continue Souza to December 18 yes, had that, has this ever opened yes uh, I'm sorry you're right I should go over that uh, this matter opened on October 30th and the quorum is everyone except John okay so those of you that are on the quorum, could I have a motion to continue Sousa to December 18th? So moved. Second. All those in favor? That's unanimous. By the way, Mr. Chairman, I won't be here on the 18th, so the Vice Chair will be happily in charge that night of continuances. Continue to, to December 18th with no testimony. The second is Joseph Grazi OC, construct a low earthen vegetated berm on lawn area between existing residents and salt marsh as a means of preventing tidal floodwaters from reaching House Foundation and crawl space area at 1085 Craigville Beach Road, Centerville, as, a, as shown on Assessor's Map 206, Parcel 100. This matter opened on October 16th it was continued on November 13th without testimony, and then continued to tonight. The quorum is all commissioners present. Good evening. Good evening, members of the commission. Uh, Mike Ball from Baxter and I Engineering. As you mentioned, I was here uh, with Matt Eddy on the uh, 16th of October. Um, we had a great discussion regarding um, how, to, how to review and design and, and consider projects in a resource area where there are no performance standards and that's that's what we're dealing with here is a, uh, a land subject to coastal storm flowage I will also refer to it as the coastal flood zone uh, <laughs> I'm not comfortable with that acronym the LSTF SF so coastal flood zone if we're all good on that um, so my task was uh, at the last hearing was to prepare um, some to prepare answers to some questions that the DEP analyst, uh, Rada Masson, uh, had posed in an email on the 16th of October. Um, this was an email to Darcy uh, regarding uh, recommended considerations when looking at projects um, in land subject to coastal storm flowage. Now this, this project, as you know, abuts uh, salt marsh. We've also got coastal banks, so we're not we're not dealing with just one resource area. We've got three essentially that are that are relevant here. Um, as a review, this is a uh, kind of a, a small property scale project uh, where Joseph Graziosi um, has just and he testified at the last hearing that he has seen uh, water and witnessed water um, from the spring tidal flood events reaching his foundation of his house uh, on eight different occasions. That was an estimate. Um, and so he had approached Steve Wilson um, a couple of years ago, I think, uh, regarding what could he possibly do. And so we came up with this, 
the solution. Well, we could propose a berm that would be constructed between an existing coastal bank and some fill beneath his, his back deck. Um, if you've been out to the property and if you've been to some of the properties along Short Beach Road, um, all of them have over time had fill uh, placed in order to build the houses. Um, I haven't done, I've walked a lot of those properties, but I haven't walked the ones along um, the sure. other, other side of the embayment. We're dealing with the Centerville River and it's kind of a thumb embayment and Mr. Graziosi's property is at the, at the eastern end of this, of this embayment and that's relevant to this, uh, to this project. So the proposal is a 45 foot berm. Um, the amount of material is roughly 250 cubic feet or nine and a half cubic yards. Um, the, the footprint of the project is somewhere between 275 and 350 square feet on an existing lawn area, and the height uh, of this berm varies uh, one to two feet vertical f uh, in vertical feet from one end to the other. Um, so uh, it's, it, I did prepare this letter. Um, you may not, we submitted it right before Thanksgiving. I think Matt emailed it. Uh, to Darcy on Wednesday right before the, the holiday so you may not have seen it until yesterday or today but what I did is I took those questions that were posed in uh, DEP's email and I just um, addressed them uh, one by one in the body of the letter um, I, we could go one by one question by question or we can just have a discussion about what we're thinking um. Uh, why don't you just respond to questions from commissioners? That's probably the easiest. John? I think what we did was specify these questions and send it back. This is a pretty small project. Yes, Once it is. again, I think that you guys adequately answered all of the issues that were raised before. So I think it's ready to be moved forward. Myself. Uh, do you think maybe, uh, John, we should have a finding on this? That this, uh, you know, after review by the commission, the commission finds uh, no adverse impacts and that we consider this uh, uh, de minimis? Yes, I would think that would be an excellent idea. Uh, could I have one, someone make that finding? So moved. And a second? second. All right, all those in favor? Nope. I'm Do sorry. Oh. Just in case, I see. No, yes, no, okay. no. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> all right, Thanks so we have staying. a motion and a second on the finding. All those in favor? And that is unanimous on the finding. And now based on the finding, could I have a motion to approve this so project? Moved. And a second? Second. All those in favor? It's unanimous that the your project okay. is approved. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thanks for your time. For yes. Interesting stuff. Appreciate coming, it. Coming forward, you'll have some interesting projects, I'm sure. And, yeah. <laughs> well, with Seth helping you, I think that's wonderful. So. Mr. Chairman, I turn it back to you. Signature is coming down. We have two easy certificates of compliance, Montgomery SE3-5371, Anderson, SE3-5228. Have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor is approved. We have two sets of minutes, October the 30th and November the 6th. Could I, have, I would move to approve as submitted. Second. All in favor is approved. Good night. Good night, Good night have a motion Thanks to adjourn. Staying. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, we are adjourning at 912.